Good morning, all. Uh, we may just have to wait for a couple of more minutes. We are waiting for a huge group to join us, and we don't want them to miss the updates. Meanwhile, anybody wants to take pen and notepad, it's there. Speakers for the laptop, it's here. Stickers, lot of stickers uh, for your laptops. Supersonic, subatomic. Uh, Orcus as well as uh, Red Hat Open Shed. I speak loud, but still the disc is going to hear you going to hear me more louder. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so thanks for getting me here. I think I need to thank the Hyderabad Jag for getting me here. So how many of you literally do Java development? I know people here are guys like how many of you do Java development? Yeah, I want every hands up, right? So because that's that's what this talk is all about. So um, so I, I work for uh, Red Hat as a director for developer experience. My major role is doing evangelism and advocacy around Java. And I've been in the industry for the last 20 years now. 
and then actively do uh, evangelism around serverless, service mesh, Kubernetes, and all these stuff, right? Um, and the links here, like that's my email handle. I have my Twitter handle. Probably if people who have missed to tweet, I put again my QR code to tweet again. If you tweet, I have a three lucky winners who will be getting some goodies from me. What, you don't, don't ask me what goodies are there. I'm still not decided on that, all right? <laughs> So uh, you can do this and then the bit.ly link uh, will have the slides. I'll be uploading that after the session. And I'll also share with uh, Sujit to be posting on the jug page so that they can have it there. And uh, all the commands like the, the code demos that I'm going to show today is everything is available on the bit.ly Quarkus tutorial. I'm just going to show you the miniature of that. So that don't worry in case if you miss my commands, don't worry about that. All I want you to grasp what's being done there rather than my commands, right? The commands are already available, right? Great, uh, so with that, so I want to show what Quarkus is, right? Uh, this is why I asked you like who we are, like how many of you do Java development here is because Quark, we started this a project a year back in Red Hat, like we ga it in March 2019. And this is a project where we want to say like people who thought that Java is dead. So how many of you thought that? I started to learn new languages. I want to honest answer, like even I was thinking about it, so right? So I was started to start to learn Golang or want to start to learn something Node.js or something else, right? Because we felt that Java is dead. Java is no longer available. We are doing a lot of cloud native application development where this is there, right? The only thing which you are doing was Spring Boot, but that was fat and heavy like me. So, so probably we don't want that. And this one and has is all developers, like it belongs to us. So that's the reason why we say like we started with Quark and then we put all us together. So us as developers, uh, to be very honest, that is the hardest thing in computer science. It's not the programming language. The developers are the hardest stuff to get. So that's the reason why we thought to put this way. So what Quarkus is all about, uh, it's an open source uh, stack to write Java application. Uh, what it means is like, it's not something a new runtime, a new framework or nothing like that. So don't worry about this. So do I need to add lots and lots of things to make or learn something? So it's not something still, if you are learning, if you know Java fairly well, this is going to fit your scheme of things even more easier. Right? That's what we're trying to do with this. I'll show you tools. I'll show you ways how you, you integrate this with your existing applications so that people who are already doing a lot of Java enterprise, Java application development, you don't need to ditch anything out. You can still start to do the same old stuff. But we had three motto in this when we started to do this. One is for Spring was cloud native, right? Because everybody started to go to cloud. Everybody was using cloud in one or the other way, doing microservices, serverless, and all these stuff. So what we thought is like, we want to get you to cloud native so that like it's easy for you to de develop and deploy applications on cloud, right? The second one is microservices. Obviously, many of you have started to use microservices, java-jar, your application.jar running kind of stuff. So we want to support that as well very natively. And another trend, serverless. So you want to see how to bring in serverless, right? So one of the reasons why we concentrated on all these things, especially on serverless, is because when people wanted to move serverless, so they were that's where they thought like Java is slow and Java is hard. So you want to use some other technology to go there. But that's a hard decision that has to be taken in an organization which has been doing Java development for quite long, and they have a huge pool of Java developers. If that's the case, then for somebody like who's seasoned Java developer, it's hard to learn a new language, new syntax, new semantics, and all these stuff to get in there, right? So that's where we started to see, okay, if I want some application, if I want some framework, like which can start serverless application, Java serverless application fraction of seconds, right? So people were, the, the, the principal reason of this is being like, people, when they thought about serverless, they thought only about one thing is AWS Lambda, right? They did not think about anything, right? So for that case, because that's a mindset, they started with this, but if you see behind the scenes, AWS gives you its own SDK, where you extend those classes, do all of those stuff and do a thing, right? In that case, what happens is that the control on your code is, giving, is given to somebody else, right? Not necessarily, to, not to mention just AWS, but it could be any other function provider. But what we thought to do is like, we don't want to take that control from you. We still want you to have the control. How do I package my application? How do I do all these deployments and everything? But only thing is that what we give you is a platform for a framework which can help you to do this work. So that's what we want to do. So we don't want to take your control. We don't want to take away how you actually do the application development. You can still continue to do the same way. Even in existing applications, after doing based on Quarkus, it can be put to serverless, right? So that like get the faster boot up time, faster startup time and smaller memory footprint. So you'll see more about that in a second. But why, right? We talked about a few bit of things about this agility, scalability and faster business reactivity. That's what is serverless microservices is all about. That's what we talked about in a second. But there are some truth which we need to understand. So um, most of us agree with these points, right? So why Java is slow, right? Have you ever tried 
So how many of you use containers, Java containers? Okay. So how many of you seen this OM killed message? We'll see a demo also. I'm going to show you a quick demo after this slide saying that how what, what OM killed means in Java world, right? Because Java has these things, right? It has it has to scan the class path, load the jars, annotation parsing, build the metadata, and also like add some JIT, right? Just in time compiling kind of stuff. And also like it has memory overhead uh, with classes, metadata, and compilation. And most of the case, uh, the meta space is not DC'd many times, right? And this is one of the biggest problems because your heap and memory keeps increasing again and again, and the, your application starts to crash. That's one of the biggest thing. And RSS, what we call as resident set size, that is a super critical thing when you deploy application on cloud native for other, other applications, right? For example, if you see this, we have node, we have node in sense it's not node.js, node as in a compute, it could be any compute you have. If you see Java has many things, if you see Java is bloated here, it has hotspot, it has heap space, it has other space that it needs to use. But if you see node.js or golang, they just have the application, right? This is where what people start to talk about, especially in container world, especially in microservice and serverless is that it's about density. The density of my application, how many application I can pack within a particular node or a compute, so that the application can be scaled in infinitely, right? So that was something that they were talking about. Whereas if you see Java compared to the other two programming languages, if you have taken this example in a container world, Java is kind of, I mean, they were less uh, denser than the other applications. This is one of the biggest problems for enterprises because they want application to be denser. They want load application to be more, right? That's exactly what Quarkus is going to do for us, okay? So before that, if people who have not seen the container scaling, I want to show you those tiny little things. So let's go here. Uh, I'm just going to open one stuff. I just compiled a few things just in the interest of time. So uh, if people are new to uh, Kubernetes, don't worry about what this is doing. I'm just running a Docker container here. So what I'm going to do is like, let me go here. Uh, and then the Docker fail. Okay, let me see if I'm in the... You're able to see the screen. It's, it's, it's clear or you want to make it bigger? Is it okay? Let me shift to my namespace. So don't, don't worry about all these things. As I told you earlier, everything is there on the uh, on the tutorial. Let me shift to this. So, and then I'm going to start uh, watching this namespace for some pods. The first one, this particular application is using OpenJDK 8. The, I'll tell you about another version of OpenJDK. The next one is also going to be OpenJDK. The first one is like, I, I'm trying to set this application to have a memory limit of 300 M megabytes. So that's because in, when you come to cloud, your CPU can be shared, your disk can be shared, but the memory cannot be shared. So that's one important super critical thing that you do in cloud is that the memory can never be shared. That's one of the biggest thing which we are addressing in Quarkus, we'll see that in more. So what I'm trying to do here is that I'm just trying to save my application. Let me make this uh, a little bit more bigger. So I'm trying to save my application that you are given only 300 megabytes. So I'm just going to run a very, very, very simple Spring Boot application. It's not a complex application. I'm just restricting my memory. Now the problem, what happens the moment I deploy my application, my application will not start. So I'll see this OOM kill, which is nothing but out of memory, because what basically happens in that case is Java tries to allocate the complete memory of the host for this particular container, which it's not available. So let's do that, and then I'll explain more about this. So let's go and say, uh, kubectl, so don't have, uh, let's just app.yaml. So I'll just see this in, in a second, like you should start to see this uh, getting failed. So uh, <clears throat> let me watch this, uh, turn my app. Right, you see this? So now let's go and watch this also uh, on another window. Uh, uh, mini cube, SNN. Monitoring. Uh, okay, get this service right. Quarkus Grafana. Okay, I'm just open. I'm just opening a Grafana dashboard to show you what happens here. So how many of you know about Grafana? Just monitoring Grafana. Great. So I'm just using a, so this is an out-of-box thing which comes with Kubernetes to see your workload that runs on a pod. If you see this namespace, let me go to demos namespace. 
and you see this pod this pod let me go a little bit down here and then see how much the my app is kind of having 3 and 3 and mb right now but it's killed let's start again for some time it keep killing it keep crash i think it keeps killing because like it's not able to get the memory by default if you understand uh, let's i think it should come come back in a second let me get the network out here probably on a wrong window here so just to show you like how much getting allocated if you see this this app is kind of getting allocated to 251 mb right the memory usage all right but i'm giving only a memory limit of 300 if you see the memory limit is coming more than 80% more than 80% of this thing is allocated because that's the natural way by which java does like if you know the java heap allocation is kind of by default is 1/4 right and then like what happens is basically it goes and sees my host in this case it's a it's a kubernetes uh, thing which is running inside it's a vm the vm has 8 gb so it's going and seeing this 8 gb has this available memory and then trying to allocate 1/4 of 8 gb for this which is not available for it right approximately close to this we cannot go to the precise number but that's a problem with java initially because it was not able to know like it was thinking that when it's running within a container it was thinking that everything of the host is its memory right because this was a bug in java initially probably java was prepared for the containers and that they fixed in jdk 8 u131 and above so if you're going to use i'm just going to redeploy the new application right now in jdk u131 and above what they they started to do is like they introduced this uh, experimental options where they can understand the c groups so everything what drives behind this thing is called a c groups in linux world the c groups is something which can know like what's my available memory what my file system which i can use for my system the c++ and other languages golang or node.js everything naturally understand c groups so that like when they run they take the memory they know how much they are allowed to run and then they can initially allocate the memory based on that right otherwise it's going to fail so but java was not prepared for that that was the only principal reason why it was failing initially so let's do let's do this so i'm just going to delete this app again and then do a new deployment um you don't actually need to do this in in kubernetes i can overwrite it but for clarity i'm just deleting this so if you see the new one what i did is like i just took a new image so which which is jdk 8 again but u131 and above build right this is not a jdk u131 build the previous one here was jdk 131 and below and this one is jdk 131 and above right so that has these capabilities built in and also it has also as an ability to understand my java options i'll show you the difference between these two things this is this is super super critical when you are kind of developing containers with java I have to understand that when I develop containers, I need to know that Java will not understand these things. So a few things which I have to set the memory limits and other stuff. So we have to start doing it if we are using JDK eight. Okay, I'll come back to nine in a second. What also happened in nine? So now in this way, what I'm trying to say is like I'm just giving it a heap size, XMS and XMS size, so that like it like try to restrict itself within that limit, and then try to allocate the heap space within that one. Right. So let's do this. Go and apply this again. So it should be running now in a second, and then let's see what happens here. Let me go and reload my monitoring screen, and then let's say last five minutes. I'm not bothered about CPU usage. Uh, I'm just bothered only about my memory usage. we see now the the new one which is coming here so it takes some time for it to allocate so you'll see that it's getting allocated only the needed one right so let me see if it is running here and turn my app just seeing the log to see if everything is up the container started it's not getting killed right now because i had given it as a heap space here and then now we see this this is getting 128 mb of prep right so which is approximately it's almost close to half because still the application needs it but it's not doing it more than see if it's, see this this is 62% of what is there rather than the 80% 80 plus percentage which we saw there right which is actually killing your processes inside the container also right which was kind of killing it completely then now with adk8 you once even above if you send java options with xms options it was able to understand it well okay but still this is not precise okay from the container world from c groups perspective this is still not very nice because i don't want to send something from my side i want the java application is running inside plus the container to naturally understand what's exactly happening behind right instead of it's taking decision i am forcing things right so that's what i'm going to do in my next thing so i'm just going to kill this one as well uh, let me delete this the next one what i did is like so as i told earlier 
So let me uncomment this out. Just still going to use the same JDK uh, 8 bill. But what they did um, in JDK U131 above, they started as an unlock diagnostic VM option, right? And then if you exactly see this one right there, so this particular one right there, you see groups limits. So this one was added as an experimental option in JDK 131 and above. So which means that they actually coded in Java into Java code JDK that you understand C groups now, right? So when you're running within a container, if you know that you're running within a container, try to understand that you have to use C groups for the heap space and don't go by your own assumptions, the default assumptions. That's what you're trying to do here. I'm trying to say like use C groups memory limit for heap. This was started as in JDK 8. It was started as an, <clears throat> I said, unlock experimental VM options. I have to give this for this flag to be enabled. So otherwise it's not enabled by default, all right? Let's see what happens with this. So this should be, with this case, uh, it should have, it should allocate the same stuff much in a neater way. Let me go and apply this again. And then let's see the container is up and running. And then let's go here and do a refresh. I see a new one coming up. Okay, should have one more uh, app memory quota coming up here. So which one was this? Let's see what's the name of this. This is 8R. Q2T. Let's see which is 8RQ2T. This is the one. So, how much is taking? Let's give it some time for the data to be reported. Uh, last five minutes, and then let's do a refresh. All right. So, let's see how much this one is take is going to take right now. And if you see this, this has come up to RSS 72 and 62 one. And then I'm not done any kind of adjustment. But still what it was able to do is like it was able to try to get to that is that 82 krt 125 mb was 300 thing and 40 percent right i've not done anything i'm not uh, doing any xms and xmx all these settings but obviously with that particular flag with jdk 8 and a 131 now introduced so i was able to do this naturally so without without me adding these kind of extra flags and other stuff because if you understand in java world the hardest thing is to performance tune how many of you agree that? How many have you had pains? Even today, I don't know how to do it properly, right? Because that's the hardest thing you have to do. So you need to, you know, let's leave all these things to the containers because like how the other languages leave to the containers to do the job. I mean, the underlying platform to do the job. We'll also make Java also do the same thing, leave it to the underlying platform so that we can worry only about our business and other later stuff which you are doing out of the application. All right, any questions until now? Okay. So what happens also uh, with the other one, so I had another thing also, I'll share this code with you guys, it's already there. With nine, what happens is that I don't even need to specify this. I'm just gonna completely comment this out. With nine, what I, what I get, this is another one, which is nine. Uh, it'd be, let me find out what's the, uh, the name of the image. Uh, it should be container nine. I think I have built it. If I'm not, uh, let it build it now. So let me see if I build it or not. So I just do an apply again. I hope I did. Uh, did build that. Uh, so what happens? Let me explain why it comes up. Uh, is that what basically happens here is that with nine, even I don't need to specify it as experimental. It has come as a default option within your JDK. So in that case, even if I'm running within a container, the JDK is capable of understanding that I'm running within a container and apply all the C groups. There are other flags. If you look at the JDK documentation, there are also other flags related to this, which you can enable this. That gets naturally applied even without you doing anything. In this case, in the eight case, I have to do this experimental options. But if you use nine, eleven and other stuff like you don't actually need to even add these options it gets naturally allocated but if we still see it's, it will be more efficient as well so we have this application running so which is uh, m2d82 and if you see this this will be much more efficient in doing this work uh, and again obviously nine plus has some performance improvements so they have these ones also naturally allocated here so let's see how much it is taking uh, let's me refresh this once more Take some time as the application needs to boot up. And if you see uh, this one, so this is kind of taking a pretty much less memory to let's give some more time for it to refresh. 
Um, and if you see this, what happened, what I was trying to say is that on the, as the JDK was moving progressively, it was also trying to adapt itself for the container native development. That's what the whole point, right? And the first thing, the first moment you start to develop for containers, the first one you'll be facing is the OEM killed as I showed earlier. Like initially you would not have any clue what was happening because your containers, the Java running within the app application running within the container was not able to understand your C group stuff. That's a very fundamental point there. Right? We tried to avoid that and Java improved on, on top of all those things. The, even the JDK has baked in all those options for you to understand the C group stuff, right? So now in this case, if you see this, this was able to understand all those stuff and then it's gonna naturally allocate your memory for you. In this case, like it was doing, if you see this was more efficient, in fact, you see this, your, your percentage still remains same. I've not done any options, but still it was able to take what is necessary for it, right? Make sense? Right. All right, let's go further uh, into our, let me clear this off before I get to my next example. Uh, that was uh, here. That was a little demo which I want to show you guys. So, um, so what also happens right now is that you're trying to make Java progress, right? So that's the whole idea here. So we say like we started Java with what, let's say, uh, the last box on the deep end of the uh, road. It says like that. We started with the EXEs or the Swing-based application. How many of you worked on Swing applications? One, two, three, four. Okay. So I also have two. One more hand for that, right? I love Swing, in fact. So, so we started with Swing-based application long back. And then we said, okay, Java, the only way to have Java applications run in multiple stuff is using Swing. And then we bought in all these JSPs and other stuff which came here, which has become, made them client server. But now we are, we are in a cloud native world, right? And then we want to have cloud native capabilities added to Java, right? Java has to be a natural choice for developing cloud native applications. So that's where we are going to take Java with Quarkus. So that was the main motto behind Quarkus is to make Java cloud native and Kubernetes. In fact, Kubernetes native again, because everything now today is a talk about Kubernetes, right? And you also want to take Java, very uh, de facto uh, programming language in Kubernetes world as well, right? So how it works? Uh, so Java, what Java, uh, as I told you, the Quarkus is not a runtime. So this is one thing which you have to keep in mind. So Quarkus is more at a build time. So what I mean by this is that, so if I build a jar out of Quarkus, if I have an application server, or even if I'm going to do Java dash jar as a way of starting application, I can still do that. No big deal. There's not going to be anything changed. If I'm going to take that and deploy it as a web application, I can do that also as a web application, but nothing is going to stop you from doing this. Because everything what is done in Quarkus is done at build time. So we are going to spend things at build time, saying that we're going to identify the application class sources, what is going to be there. We are going to use the thing called Gizmo. If I heard of Gizmo, so Gizmo is something like which can going to take out all the metadata reading from your stuff. And then also like it's going to relocate all the dead code elimination will be done. And it will be augmented with Quarkus. And then this Quarkus will give, be giving you a runner jar, right? The only thing what you have to do here is that we'll talk about that later is that you have to use Quarkus specific dependencies. I can also bring my own dependency as Quarkus. That's a different story. I think it's an advanced case of Quarkus. So what you're trying to do is like, we're trying to make all the common dependencies that's available, especially for your for a case of any enterprise application, it's going to be ORM, Hibernate plus, plus those things, right? We made sure that those things have come and we have a list of things we are kind of moving into Quarkus. We're just recompiling them as Quarkus based stuff so that you can just start using those dependencies in your Java application, okay? And this is what it does. It arguments the code, arguments the byte code, eliminates all the class things and all the stuff and then takes you to the next thing, right? And then to speed it up, uh, so this is a, uh, uh, this is a typically a Java mode. So what I call this, I'm sorry. So this is a Java mode for running the application. So if I'm mean, in case, like if I want more performance, so what I try to do is like, we try to use Substrate VM from Graal, and use a Graal compiler to kind of compile this application into a native binary, right? What you get out of the box here is, we give you the same uh, runner jar, which already generated. We do this kind of native executable using native compilation using Graal. We make sure Graal Substrate VM gives you all the necessary things to eliminate your dead code, your dependencies and everything gets built inside and then your JVM is taken out and then everything is compiled as a native binary. It's going to be a Mac OS binary or a Linux binary, okay? Windows is kind of supported, but not completely supported yet by Graal. Okay. So the difference between these two things is that the JVM mode and the Graal and the native mode has the native mode has a 30% more performance compared to your JVM mode. So you'll, you'll see that in example as well. So this is the overall stack which you have right now. 
So we have REST EC. So everything is based on Eclipse microprofile uh, specification. So we have REST EC, NETI, Hibernate, and then we have a few other things like JOT, Eclipse Vertex. Vertex is going to be the one is going to be used for your imperative and reactive engine, right? And then we have we are adding few more stuff is getting added, and all the research and, the, and everything that you're going to do behind this are getting pushed into Eclipse microprofile as a standard as well. So which means that if you're going to use Eclipse microprofile for your microservices development, then Quarkus already covers all those stuff inside this. Okay. And then we have the Quarkus core, which takes care of doing this whatever called as augmentation and other stuff, which is done during build time. And then we have Jandex, which kind of creates your index, the Java index is called as inside this. And then just more for your metadata gender, and then we use Graal SDK to kind of convert this dead code elimination. So I have two slides at the last for dead code elimination. I'm just going to I'm not going to talk about that in detail, but I put them like so where you understand what dead code elimination is. Okay. And then we use dependency injection out of the box using ARC. How many of you heard about ARC? ARC. So ARC is again for JBoss uh, kind of stuff like where we had this ARC thing, which is just your DI dependency injection. So one of the reasons why people actually move to Spring Boot, right? Apart from the programming model is because I want CDI. I want to do auto wiring. I want to do all these stuff, right? So we'll also be doing same things here as well. So, but this is using naturally it added to it. So you don't need to do anything extra, right? And then we have hotspot and that's for the uh, jar based JVM based mode. And then we have substrate VM where we get the native executables. All right, so th this is how the build process works. I take my app jar, I take my frameworks, compile and then provision and just take all this wiring and augmentation will be done, remove all the unnecessary classes from here, okay? And then I just make it anywhere, like we want to have a general app or a native app. Okay, we'll also see this example in a second, like how do we, how small your jar will become. So one of the things we avoided there is that uh, we had tried to avoid this Uber jar concept. So, um, so if you know the two big reasons for Java being slow, right? From my perspective, maybe you can also correct me if I'm wrong. One is that Java applications startup is slow because I have this Uber jar concept nowadays, like the application servers like. Because of that, what happens is that I have to load all the classes into my memory and then do all the other things which you start. And when you saw in a couple of slides earlier that you have to do all these things in memory and then boot slow, right? I have to resolve my dynamic classes, everything. The moment I start to dynamic classes, which means that I need to use reflection. Reflection is one of the, I can call it blessing in disguise for Java. If you use it effectively, then it's powerful. If you don't use it effectively, it's going to be a disaster for you, okay? So that is, those are the two things which are causing Java application to be slow and not a real candidate for cloud native application development, right? That's what you try to solve here. Let's see an example again. So how do you create your application? We'll create a very simple uh, Quartus application here to just to start with. So how many of you use VS Code here? I know uh, Suji they said for some uh, what do you call idea coupons, but please please feel to tell me like how many of you use VS Code here. One okay. So I was a big idea guy, but I moved to VS Code because for my thing like I even started my case like started with Notepad to write Java code, and then, which means that I don't have editors, I don't have the complete intelligence, whatever you call us. I think what these I think there are a bunch of college kids here. So you're introduced to IDEs. So you are what you do is like you just put a dot and I get all the API methods right. So when I started, like I have to remember everything off it, right? So like, okay, Java, these are the APIs I have, these are the methods I have, and then otherwise I get my compilation errors, okay? So um, VS Code is one of the things Purple and Red Hat, what we have done is like we have contributed to VS Code, the complete Java stack, which helps you to get your Java application development running on VS Code. And that's one of the highest downloaded VS Code extension so far. And we also started to do with Quarkus extension also, which means that I can do every complete Quarkus stuff, without leaving my editor. I don't call this IDE anymore, I call it editor. Because all I need is just a Java editor, not an IDE. So I can do everything within the Java ID without leaving this out of this as well, right? So let's see how we can get to do this. <clears throat> the first thing um, you have to do is like, let's go here and then, so when you, uh, I think if you know the shortcuts, just to cap this command, there is a, if you install the uh, extension, there's a Quarkus extension here. So you just do Quarkus. So this is the extension which I was talking to you about is provided by Red Hat. Okay, so, and then like, if you see this extension is already added. And then if you see the uh, Java extension pack, so I think, uh, yeah, this is the one from Microsoft, which has, which has the, uh, all the stuff which is given here, including the, uh, the language support, that's given by Red Hat. Okay, this is kind of adding around 3 million 
downloads or something okay so let's go here so to create a quarkus project all i have to do is like just go here generate quarkus project it'll ask you which support both gradle and maven are supported i need to choose which one i want i'm just going to say maven because i'm a web guy i'm just going to call this app as fruit app just say and then i'll just me put this version as 01 and then ask you what all things you want to have just the first class the skeleton class that gets generated and once you have this it will now list you all the extensions that is supported right now by quarkus right we have all these extensions the list of extensions is there you can read about those extensions uh, in this site if you go to quarkus.io so that is the site which i'm talking about here all right so let me go to the home here and then this is site so if you go here this is Quarkus.io. I have the links on my slides. Don't worry if you miss this uh, site also. And when we have all the guides getting started, and then other guides related to covering many of the stuff which you talk about today. Okay, and then the tutorial also covers in depth details about these things as well. So you can go to here and start going. Doing the, and you have a similar one like what the this, the start.spring.io kind of stuff, right? You can just do code.quarkus.io to start doing the same thing for the browser as like what I'm doing here. I'm not going with any any extensions for the first uh, demo, so I'm just using REST Easy for JAX RS just to give me the REST API capabilities, and that's it. And then let me go here and say I want to get it generated in my I'll just create a new folder, uh, call this basics or something. Right. And then <clears throat> and then I want to open in a new window so that it's I get a much better clarity of this. And then you'll see in a second, like it'll understand this Java overview because this Java is there. And then you should also see Quarkus overview also coming in a second. It will start to identify the Quarkus plugins here, right? So let me put it here. Right, you also have the Quarkus tools enabled as well. So if you see this class, so uh, it basically generates you a form XML. So this idea is a little bit different from, you will be wondering, like I have archetypes, why I'm not using archetypes? The idea is a little bit different from what the archetypes are because we found that archetypes capabilities is very less. I can tell you, I can create a generational code, but I cannot have other things which I want to have, right? I think I'll be showing a few other developer features in this. So where will be able to help you to kind of do the coding, do the development, see the changes happening dynamically, right? So uh, so what you did is like we created a plugin where you have all these options passed to the plugin instead of this. And that way, what we are also able to do is because it's a plugin, we will be able to use that in any other integration that you want. And with archetypes, I cannot do integrations, right? That's what the whole motto behind why we did this way. So if you see this, this is this actually has all your uh, the basic dependencies which I'm talking about. Um, I hope this is bigger. Uh, too big is like it's hard for me to read in the screen. So it has the only one dependency here, which is kind of uh, your rest easy. And then if you open the class here, the class is, uh, it will be very hard for you to understand. Okay. This is the class which you generated. Okay. It's a simple hello world for you. So don't worry. I'm just kidding. So, uh, so we just say hello here kind of stuff. It gives you the basic skeleton of your JAX RS REST EC based application, how we can generate. You can add more features on top of this, whichever you want to add, right? For example, you'll see that in the other examples and other demos you're going to cover. So how do I get started? So we'll see three ways now. The first way is that we'll start in a development mode, and then we'll also start in a, compile that in a java-jar mode, right? Um, so let's do this. So the first one I'm going to do is like, and just open this uh, terminal here. Obviously my test will fail because I have an access running in this thing. I'll show you what, how to avoid this. So we also have these properties. We'll talk about that also here. So I just need to refer to my paper so because I have my script here. So I'll just use this one right on this corner. Uh, not sure why my screen is uh, kind of little bit lower here. Okay. So that I can do the code and this thing right here. Okay. All right. Great. So the first way for us to start doing this is since it's a Maven project, all I have to do is like MVN compile. Okay, I'm just going to do skip test. As I told you, I'll tell you why I'm skipping the test because the test by default runs on port 8081. 
and i have a local nexus running on the same port so obviously my test will not will fail so i just there is no big test here so i'm just trying to avoid that so i'm just going to skip test or you can also put this if you are maven proficient in maven the simple way to do this like just to avoid multiple times i just put this skip test here so i don't need to add this command here right and i say uh, come on so let me put this let me make this smaller so that i can have this prompts coming up all right so i'll just put it within the screen so this is the first one just keeping the test and then i say maven clean i mean just say package so clean package so as i said the build is fairly fast and what i want you to observe right now is that few things i just this is the one which is going to excite you guys java dash jar target i said i have to start the runner jar there you go so what i want you to observe is this little thing on my screen which is and read this 0.6 Three seconds to start your Java application. Have you ever seen your Java application starting in 0.6 seconds? It's still the Hello World application. I can understand, but even the Hello World application, which the frameworks which you already seen, have you ever seen that it starts in 0.6 seconds? No, right? And this is the first exciting thing which people develop, and then we have the profiles activated. So what is what do I mean by profile? Is that so? For example, the natural way that developers will do is that like let me start in this way, right? So let's say I want to avoid these things, these colored coding, right? On on production, right? Similarly, we'll be having database configurations. We'll be having other set of configurations. So what we have done with uh, things like we just say prod, dev prod and test. We have three profiles by default. Whenever we set some properties like this, is right? Quarkus. So this is the extension capability of the extension because it pulls out all the properties and is supported. I say colored, and then I say false. Okay, this is one of the examples I'm giving you here. So in this case, what I'm trying to say that what is what what is mean by prod is that we'll also be seeing a development mode. Prod mode is nothing but when I run with the Java dash jar kind of stuff, right? I compile the jar and run the jar. In dev mode, I'll not be compiling the jar, but I'll be compiling the classes alone. That is a dev mode. Obviously, you know the test mode, right? When I run Maven test. Okay. It naturally understands these things when I when I do percentage prod, percentage dev, or percentage test. It understands that these properties has to be applied only when it's running in the respective modes, right? That's the whole idea. In this case, what I'm trying to do is I'm just trying to say this one in prod mode. Just do this in dev mode. I'm just going to say, don't do this, right? You don't need to do this, but I'm just saying an example. By default, it's true. So now, what happens when I do a compile uh, and then run again? You'll see that the color coding will go off. Because like I don't I don't no longer use color coding right now, and then when I do Java dash jar, so now everything is point blank, right? It's everything the color coding has gone because I'm running in a production mode. That is how you see that, right? When I say running in production mode is what I see here. Prod mode activated. So when I say prod mode activated, my this particular property that's there here gets applied, whichever is percentage prod, any property that is percentage prod, right? That gets applied and then it starts in this particular mode, right? So now what gets more interesting is that um, this is the first difference probably it's not to ridicule any other framework that's not my intention or anything else but let's say in imagine a case I'm, many of you are spring boot developers right so what you will do if you want config properties the application properties what i mean by this right so you need to add one more dependency if i'm not wrong spring config or something that basically does this job for you right so what and then you also do all these annotations and other stuff so what you have done with quarkus is that we use microprofile config if you are aware of that. So with microprofile config, it's already baked inside the Quarkus code, which means that I don't need to add another additional dependency. So what I mean by this is, let's imagine a case. I want to improve this application, saying that I don't want a hard coded value here. I want to get it from my properties, right? So naturally, what I do is like I just say a string. Let me call this as a message. This is the first thing which I want to do. I say message. Uh, A G E M E S S. I'm messing with it. Okay. 
message and then now i'd say config property and then let's let me call this as name equal to my yeah let me call this my message so now what happens is this this property when a moment i say this this is coming from eclipse microprofile config so if you're aware of if you go to eclipse microprofile like this is here let's i just put a google for this so it will bring up this window for me eclipse microprofile so this is uh it is kind of donated to the uh, eclipse foundation and we are the biggest contributors for this again and we have a lot of things in this right metrics i think you can just read about this when you have time i'll put this also as part of my resource links so that you can go back here so this gets naturally injected here so now what happens is that when i save this particular message i'm going to say instead of doing this i'm going to say return this message okay you might be wondering i can also have an option to put a default value but i'm not going to put a default value in this case i can just say here and then say control space i can have a default value in case if it's not defined but i'm not going to do this the moment what right now happens is that so when you put this so it will also the tooling effect which we're giving here let me say it here so let me save this here you see this here my dot message is not set okay this is again an improvement to the developer experience because we are tying the Quarkus development with your ID, the editor as well, not ID. I think they were also probably doing for idea also to come up. But now I use this property many times. What we try to do is like we define a property, but we never add the property to your properties, application properties, right? In that case, what happens, you'll not find it when you do the development, you do a deployment, you'll find the error and you have to do, go back and forth on this. So what you have done with this is that we are giving these kind of alerts for you saying that, okay, you have not done this. So try to go and add this up, all right? So now when I go here, I just say copy this one and then put it here and saying instead of this uh, I say hi okay so this is going to be my default message so now the another mode of Quarkus what we call us is developer joy the true developer joy is that I can do my active development and active changes in, in tandem right what I mean by this is I'm going to start this one MVN compile Quarkus called as dev mode. Okay, so this is called as a dev mode, which is given by the plugin. The moment I do this, so it will start Quarkus in dev mode. And you see this, my dev mode is activated. And also, you see these two things here, right? So, here, my dev mode is activated and my live coding is also activated, which means that whatever changes I make to my code is going to be reflected immediately. I mean to say not only code, your application properties, your XMLs, anything is there in the class path, any files are there in the class path, right? So in this case, what I'm going to do is like, you also see a tooling effect here. So this is a Jack Saras method, uh, running here. And then if I just adjust my semicolon, you'll start to see this URL for this particular API, right? This is also available. So again, a tooling effect. This is not Quarkus effect, but this tooling effect, which means that when you're wondering what should be in my URL to open this particular application window, then I'll get these URLs as well. And it's live editable, which means that if I change the path from hello to hello test, it's also, it's also going to change, right? Let me do this. Instead of hello, what I do is I go here and change this to API. Okay. And then you see this API is getting changed. And then I also say the path. And then I say slash hello. Okay. You see this change happening. So which is live code, which allows you to kind of go and see what should be my URL in case if you're going to write to test cases to say how I have to test these applications. This could also be done. And then the moment you open this, obviously you'll get the resource not found because it's getting loaded right now. So now when I go and refresh this back, let me go here. Happen slash API slash hello. This is the one. Okay, let me do a curl of this. It's not saved, right? I'm sorry. Okay, so and now again, it's a good thing that I made this mistake. So what I want to show you people is that many of the tools which does this live reloading or live coding, right? Like JRebel and all these stuff. So what they basically do is like the moment the change happens, even in dirty state, it's going to reload. So that's something which we have avoided with Quarkus live reloading is that unless and until I save, 
and then issue a call back to the application. In this case, let's say you call any URL of the application, right? Or even reload of the application. That's a time when the recompilation will happen. So which means that, so the recompilation will happen only when I'm sure that I've done the changes in all the necessary places so that I don't have cascading failures. So you're taking care that this is actually, this example actually showed you that because it was not able to load because I did not save. So it was still reflecting the old API. Right, we just had hello in that case, so it was not loading this, it's showing the old error right on my screen. Now, since I saved this now, still the reload is not happening. So, now the moment I say reload again, access the API again. So, let me say uh, curl or HTTP is the tool I use uh, localhost 8080 slash API slash hello. Now, you see this, so this one is changed right now. And then this is kind of giving you this reload happening right here, right? And then also can open this now in browser to get the response back, right? So this is this is, we can also do it. The another one, the another one which I also wanted to show here is that so since I'm loading here, this is not only for your uh, form changes. Okay, let's say I want to add an extension, right? We'll talk about extension in a second. If I want to make something add a dependency to form XML, that also gets slightly loaded. You'll see that in the example later when you start to do a database application development and there also we'll try to do this but this case this loaded for me now what happens i want to show this i want to disable this guy saying that even in dev mode i want this to be false so this is a property reloading right so when i go back here again and then do so now we see this the property gets reloaded and your color coding is gone okay which means that i also be able to reload the properties xml files import.sql files whatever you have it in class path without any big fuss All right the other one which i also wanted to show you is that so these properties can also be treated as enrollment variables so what i mean by enrollment variables let's go here instead of let me stop it for a second i don't actually need to do that so let's say this my, what does micro profile do is like if you take this particular case right this gets translated into environment property like this. You see this? So all dots becomes underscores, all dashes become underscores, and any property I'm having like this on a property file, I can use these kind of a notation or a convention, the typical convention of your environment properties, and then I can also make this to load from there. Okay. So for example, let's imagine that I want to have this set from command line. Okay, so let me put this one here and then say export my message equal to let me say namaste. Okay. All right. And then now when I start to do my dev mode, this thing takes precedence from enrollment variable. And then when I say the call again, you see here, so my enrollment variable takes precedence now. So I can use any of these combinations. So this is very useful in cases when you're going to deploy my application onto cloud. And then now what happens, I want to quickly do a test, right? And then see whether something has changed works or not. For example, I want to make it to map to another property file or another database or something like that to quickly see if that is working. Then I don't need to do a redeployment. Instead of that, I can go change, add an environment variable onto your thing. And then in that case, what happens, it loads from the environment variable and checks the thing and lets you know. Once you're good, then you do a recompilation and redeploy, right? And especially when you're doing with Kubernetes, it's very easy to flip a container, just changing the environment variable. The moment the environment variable changes in a Kubernetes container, your container gets restarted, which means I have a fresh application up and running. In this way, what happens is you, your thing takes precedence over, your environment variable takes precedence over your property files. And that's what the usual convention which many of the frameworks follow. And the only thing you have to take care of is that you have to follow the convention of environment variable, which means that all dots become underscore, all dashes become underscore. That's how we write an environment variable because environment variable will not accept dots, will not accept dashes, I mean hyphens. Okay, so you just need to convert them into these things so that it gets loaded for you as well, right? So any questions until now, how we do this? Yes, please. Yes. Yeah, see, it's, it's not dumb. It's a very good question. The question is here is that can I run Quarkus? I mean, on any containers I wish to run time. Container runtimes, that's what we call us in container world. Absolutely. The whole idea here is that 
for us to make quarkus is kubernetes native meaning to say that you have a standard way of packaging which is containers if i'm able to package my application as container i can run it in any place i want whichever supports container so our goal with quarkus is that we want to make quarkus more efficient for cloud native application development microservices serverless where people were having doubts that java will not work we want to change that mindset in people that's all idea so you can do anywhere you want or oh, no, even if you can even you can take this and run it azure functions also aws lambda also i think there are some guides if you go to our guides it also shows you how you can run there also and if you heard about apache camel the apache camel 3 is now based on quarkus which means that it can run super fast in integrations okay any other questions yes please See if you, no, that way it doesn't work. So for the application reload to happen, everything has to be within the class path. <laughs> so outside the class path, it doesn't work, right? So how do you do the native compilation? It's it's very easy again. Let's do a native compilation for this. So um, so if we see if we saw earlier the last time what we saw like well saw it 0.6 seconds was the time which is to start. Right now I'm going to do a native compilation mvn hyphen p native. If you know uh, Maven, I think we have a Maven uh, thing where we added the profile. Let me show that first for you. So <clears throat> you go here. So we have added a native profile here, which is kind of going to go and compile this particular application in your native mode, right? So there is a Quarkus plugin which is already there. It takes care of converting this into. In this case, it's going to be a Mac OS binary. It's not a Linux binary. Okay. So there is a flag which we need to add to make it to run as Linux binary. We'll see that flag later. Another demos, but in this case, I'm going to bind, make it as a, I mean, a Mac OS binary and start the application, right? If you're on Linux, Ubuntu kind of stuff, it's just going to be your Linux binary. So whichever is the platform it is there, so just going to call Mac, I mean, clean package, and then now it will start you. I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger to show you what happens behind the scenes. If we start to see this, so why we are using Graal, right? Because people were talking about that. Okay, with Quarkus, Graal is the only thing which is making you faster. Absolutely, don't believe that thing, right? It's not Graal. It's even before that we saw the diagrams on the slides. We're doing some augmentation even before Graal comes into picture. Graal is just an enabler. What you have done to do the dead code elimination, other stuff. What we also done is like when people started to use Graal, they kind of tend to know what options to pass it. Right? We have to pass the right options to make this native binary created. So what you have done with this is like since we are the guys who know the frameworks, what's the metadata and other stuff, we made sure that we pass the right options to Graal. So that the compilation happens for you in native mode, effectively. That's the whole idea. So Graal is just an enabler for us. It's not the only reason why Quarkus is faster. Okay, this is this is something which you need to understand. This native binary it takes fair bit of time, depending upon what dependencies you have. Usually, in my I think usually what I would notice in my machine is that it takes somewhere between six one minute to one minute and forty seconds. But if it's going to be more dependencies, then it has to do a lot of class path augmentation, other stuff. In this case, what happens? It, it, it completed in let's say one minute and eight seconds, right? And then it takes even more. If the machine is more powerful and more dependencies are there, it might take time. But the good thing is that everything is done at build time, not at runtime. So that is a more effective thing. I'm not going to do any kind of uh, JIT runtime uh, optimization or anything when I'm going to start this. This is just going to do in this way. Okay. So let's start this and see how fast it is. So when you see this one, so ls if an ltr uh, target. We'll see this. Uh, the executable is just created here. It is a 23 megs executable. Root app dash 1.1.0 dot runner. That's the executable which I need to run, which is a Mac OS binary in this case. So I'm just going to say uh, dot target is runner. Win. Right. You see this? I need to show you this one, right? That's where my highlighter comes into picture. 0.16 seconds. For a Java application, so how many of you doing Java for more than ten years? One, two, three, four, five. Click mark. Okay. Have you ever seen this? Java in 0.016 seconds. Any Java application starting. So this is what we have done here. So this is the super exciting stuff about Quarkus is that the moment I convert from JVM mode to native mode because there is no JVM coming into picture because everything is compiled as a native binary. The moment I do a Graal VM based native binary compilation, so everything, all the dead code is eliminated. So all my dependency graph is built, and everything is ready, so that there is no JVM overhead, and I'm going to run as native binary. 
now your garbage collection and every other stuff is going to be taken care of, like how your os is going to handle so the whole world is taken away from java okay so only big thing with quarkus is that don't use reflection so i'll talk about that in a second reflection is a kind of bad thing for quarkus still we support we say that there is an annotation which you need to add on applications to say that it needs reflection but the thing is like you don't need to actually run this okay so for this in this way what happens is like all your production mode i mean development mode you can still use jvm because you don't need to worry about compiling to native because for development you don't need a big performance boost but the moment my application lands in production then i can make this binary put it in a container and then start running the container finished job done so that we'll be seeing an example of that running as a container as well so one of the thing is that this is a dynamically linked library so what i mean by this is that it is not a static binary so all the different like for example if you heard about golang or other things we make static binaries by default so we don't we, we still we can do with graal but by default we don't do with static binaries we just use a dynamic binaries which means that i need have a very elementary os with the necessary libraries inside the zlibc glibc kind of stuff which is required inside the container in base image so that it can be compiled and run inside those things otherwise you'll get some additional failures of that okay so this is this is what the native mode and binary mode comp compilation is that so we saw about the properties the config properties um, and obviously we can also see about loggers uh, so the loggers again like uh, let's say if you want to add a jboss logger it's already there let's do that one as well just for the sake of completion so what i can do is like i can just add a jboss logger here uh, logger jboss logger .jboss.logging.logger okay. So now I get this. So this is supported with SLF4J or all the other stuff which you naturally support, but I'm just using JBoss logger for convenience because it's already there in the class path. I just use this logger and then I say uh, just to say log.info or debug. Uh, just say some message. Okay. Hello world. I'm doing this, so I don't need to worry about anything else. Now let's start to do this in a in a development mode so that we can quickly change the properties to see how to enable logging. So in this mode, when I say MBN compile uh Quarkus dev. The Corpus Dev also supports the remote mode. In case if you want to run this in a remote machine, then you can also do a remote uh, development mode as well enable, right? So I just started the live coding um, and then I don't get the log until now, even if I go to give the call here, so I'm not going to get this. So what I'll do need to do is like, I need to add, for example, let's say for dev mode, I don't say Quarkus uh, dot log, okay? The category dot level or whatever it is, right? So I'm just going to give the key. The key is nothing but your package name here. Just give this like this. And then say debug. Now what I'm trying to do is like in this case, for all my Acme code, I'm making it debug enable for the development mode. In production mode, it will be not debug. It will be info by default or warning, whatever you said it, right? And I'm going to give it back here. Now you see this hello world getting printed here. So this log gets enabled. In this way, I can also enable the logs, check the logs, while doing development and then I can remove it out also. This gives you a complete natural developer joy because I, I can go in and out of all these stuff. Okay, so you'll, you'll see more exciting stuff after this uh, with, with the database-based development. Uh, let me put this out. So any questions on this thing? Test please. Yes. I have that. I have an example for that. We come back to that. Okay. So okay, this since this, I think I want to show you I want to show you a database example and then I'll come back to spring example. I have a spring example also to show you. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yes, that will be done in native mode. Right.
Okay, uh, just to answer this, as of today, they just have an elementary support for JDK 11. So we, I think even now says because there is a simple reason JDK 9 plus, which is JDK 11, the module stuff is because Graal is yet to completely support JDK 11. Graal Substrate VM right now supports only JDK 8. They don't support JDK 11. They got, they got a kind of tech preview or a developer preview kind of stuff, which they started in the latest Graal release. We support 11. And we started to move with JDK 11 as well in that case also, right? But as of today, so when you want to start with JDK 8, because predominantly 80% of the people who are doing enterprise application development, they're not even moved away from Java 7, right? They just moved to Java 8. I'm not sure how many people are using Java 11. I think it will take some few more years for people to move to Java 11, but it will take care to answer your question. I don't have the complete answer for your question, but it should do those things as well. The module stuff as well. One of the examples which I tried out yesterday was that like when the modules was used, in some cases the module was some dependency, I threw, some error was thrown, I was debugging, I'm not sure like this because the modules was not ready for Quarkus or something like that. It had some issues, but I need to debug that, but I can get back to you. Uh, if you drop me an email, I can get back to you with the complete stuff with the exact question. They can get it from my engineering team, right? So right now we don't have, right now we don't support Java 11. We say we support Java 11, but it's at a very elementary level. It's not for production because Quarkus is now GA, which means that you can use in production. For production use, the only the, the right now the community says that supported is JDK 8, not JDK 11. That's again because of the Graal thing, right? Because we want, we want to stay synchronized with Graal, saying that Graal, because some people say that if we support them from the JVM mode, no big deal. If it's going to be Java 11 or Java 12 or Java 13 or Java 14, with Quarkus, it will go into work, right? But the moment I get to the binary mode, then I have to have the substrate VM, the Graal compiler, to support the necessary JDK versions, which right now they just give an elementary support, same like how they do for Windows binaries. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, boot fast and, and then the size of the jar is very less. Mm -hmm. Okay. You mean to say the custom JVM, right? Custom JRE, right? The problem with custom JRE is that in this case, like when I go to the native mode, there is no JRE at all. But with I'm going to JPMS and then kind of custom JRE mode, I still need to carry my JRE libraries with me, right? I cannot, I cannot take those things away, right? But Quarkus, what you're trying to say, like from your class path, from your application dependencies, what I'm doing, right? For example, like let's say I load a log for JSLF4J log dependency, right? And then they just use the logger class. Can you tell me like how many other classes inside that which I don't use? There will be tons of classes within the jar which I don't use. I just use logger plus couple of things. The logger will have let's say three more dependency classes, right? Let's say on the whole on the whole jar, let's say 50, I mean the 10 kb, 10 to 12 kb jar, I have hundreds of classes out of which I just use only five classes. I don't use the rest of other things, right? Let's say 95 classes are not there, not used at all. But still, what happens with Java is that still I need to know those 95 classes, right? Even if they are not used, it has to be in a class path because I don't know when somebody will call it. That is what we are trying to eliminate with Quarkus. We are trying to name it Jandex, Jandex, which you saw on the Quarkus architecture. But that tries to make sure that what classes I need should be loaded. And that's what gets written to your manifest file when I, the runner jar is generated, which means the runner jar has explicit entries saying that, okay, I have using only these classes to load only these classes for me. So don't, still be having a library directory with, with all the dependencies inside. But when the runner jar loads, it goes loads only the respective classes. That's the reason why it's super fast. Because there's no dynamism, and there's no reflection, nothing is there, everything has to be static at the moment I saw this. Which means that no reflection, no static initializers. So we'll see about what all things you cannot do with this, okay? So you cannot do static initializers, I cannot have, because those are all something which has to be done at runtime. You should try to avoid everything that is causing problems for you. Okay, I think that answers your question as well. Great. So uh, let's go see what else we have. So let's run the slides for a few more seconds to see what we have. Right. Uh, what else we have to see? We saw a few demos here. We'll come back to database in a second. The benefits, you saw this. So we saw the developer joy, like we're kind of creating stuff. I think how many of you took the developer joy stickers? I want you guys to go and show that in your Enterprise organization, just kidding, right? So, so that's one which I have in my laptop as well because that's true joy 
So uh, this we started like when I was working with Vertex. Um, I created the Vertex. How many of you heard of Vertex? Okay. So uh, so I was writing the Vertex Maven plugin that code got ported into uh, Quarkus, and my friend like he told me that we got this code into Quarkus. Even I don't know like it's got ported into Quarkus, right? I became an implicit contributor to Quarkus without knowing that my code is ported. Like we started this one like how Eclipse does your uh, continuous in incremental build, right? So so that like we just need these these kind of builds. And we make sure that it's done only after the save kind of stuff. Okay, no hassle. Native executable generation, streamlined code, common use cases, zero config. You don't need to do this. We are still improving that. If you see, even with Quarkus, even with the native builds, since Gra's early release, I don't know, like Google. I mean, Oracle has a funny uh, versioning thing, right? Suddenly they started with years, right? All this was 0, 12, 0, 13, 0, 14, and suddenly it bumped to 19 when they did a GA. Okay, so that's a that's a crazy uh, uh, versioning mechanism they have. So when you're doing those things, it even the first very first Graal native compilation I saw that was taking approximately three and a half minutes to build the same thing okay, inside your machine. So now like they come down up to one minute, even lesser than that. They're kind of optimizing that, so we'll be seeing seeing a lot of optimization there. And then this is what is this, and the second one is that this is a speed. This is something which I want to show you people. For the rest case, whatever you saw right now, right? So if I'm going to do my cloud, traditional cloud native stack, which could be your Spring Boot, it could be a Thron Tail, it could be any other uh, framework which you have right now, that takes you a size of 140 MB. Okay, this is going to be your RSS resident set size. It's a super critical component when you're kind of deploying application in Java, because residence set size is where it determines what is the actual memory, the heap plus metaspace plus other stuff that your JVM is taking, your Java application is taking, other than your disk and IO thing, which is already there. Okay, it excludes those things. So with this, if you see this, there's 140 MB, which is the traditional cloud native stack takes. With Quarkus, with OpenJDK is a JVM mode, which I'm talking about, it's going to take you 74 MB. You'll see that in example as well later. And then if I'm going to do a binary mode, then it's going to take you 13 MB. This is what the size. If you see this, so there is a command. I think how many of you know how to see your resident sets? Have you heard about resident set size? No, right? Because Java wide, we don't worry about. We just worry about XMS, XMX, right? So that's that's where all the problem starts. All right. So if you're going to another good thing, I'll tell you, show you how to measure that as well in a second. This is REST plus CRUD. If you see this, this is what the thing, right? If you say that traditional cloud native stuff with Hibernate and all these things put inside that. It's going to take you 218 MB. Spring Boot, in fact, takes you 450 MB plus, the same case. And then if you say Quarkus, what you've done is like it went up to 130 MB in the JVM mode. And then if it's going to be in a Graal VM mode, which is going to be 35 MB, right? When you're doing native compilation. And this is a speed. So what I mean by speed here is that the moment I say I'm up to serve your request, right? That's what I call by the response time. In this case, Quarkus with JVM mode takes you kind of about uh, 0.75 seconds. And then Quarkus Graal VM mode takes you 0 0.014 seconds. Like we saw a few examples as well there, right? And then if you see the rest plus CRUD, which includes your database initializations and other stuff, which include, and then say, I'm connected to the database, my request is ready to serve now, right? That's what it takes. It's you 9.5 seconds with any cloud native stacks. But with Quarkus and Quarkus Graal VM is kind of almost 2.5 and 0 0.055 seconds. This is to just to say I'm ready. It's not the actual application performance, all right? And then we also unified imperate in React. This is one of the common thing. Like when the, how many of you do reactive programming? Okay. So one of the things people were confused with the moment they say reactive programming is that say like what library I need to have, how I need to call, what's the programming paradigm I need to use because uh, if you see vertex. You go to use lots of lambdas and other stuff, which becomes too hard for people programmer to understand. So what we did with uh, with the with the particular Quarkus thing is that we kind of unified both the things. There's going to be one framework, built-time framework called as Quarkus, which can run both your imperative and reactive programming. That's a comparison that you see here. So I'm going to inject a channel Kafka where it's going to react to streams. So I think we should be having the last demo which I have is to show you like how we can stream from Kafka. And then show the Kafka stream data into a web browser using SSE, server send events. How many of you know SSE, the browser thing? Okay, the server send event where the application reacts to events, right? So that's what we're going to see in the last example. So, and then we, what we try to do is like, you take a single engine with Quark Vertex. The Quarkus use Vertex as one little engine to do both imperative and reactive programming. 
and they can can use both of these patterns in print and they also use crd to event driven with a single stack so what we mean by this is that we are working towards making even your database communication to be reactive yeah i think vertex already does that up to a fair extent but what postgres sql and other database we are trying to make sure that it's also done with all of the databases so we are going to give you the dependencies which you can do even based things right the moment i insert some record into my database my application is reacting okay i insert some record update my ui i'm just saying an example okay so these are the these are the frameworks this is only a little set if you go to the site they have the complete set there these are the common ones which are supported right now so we saw about prometheus some time back we will be seeing about kafka rest easy we saw about that you will also see about hibernate camel vertex etc etc okay uh, so this is something which since it's container and cloud native obviously now in java can start to embrace kubernetes more because i can start to do like other programming languages not just different not different myself saying okay i'm slow i'm fat and all these things kind of stuff right okay so uh, we'll see more examples after this so if you want to find out where quarkus is i have these slides on the chat i mean the when you get the slides is there follow us on quarkus to know about these things also you can participate with the community uh, there's a zulip chat there so which is there you can just get as part of community and then you can ask questions to our engineers directly as well as and then you also if you want to contribute to quarkus we are more than welcome to contribute to quarkus as well right so i just want to say this this is not the end so this beginning as i said earlier if people who are not seen this uh this is a tweet which you need to tweet out so which has my uh thing in that my you need to need to follow me i was just saying that's a quarkus link and everything there to make java like what he says ever awesome so once you try to do this so i have a surprise three goodies not today but that will be shipped to you for the lucky three winners okay lucky three winners from your thing i'll just send it to surjit probably you can cascade to you just start to tweet about this make quarkus much better i think this i have already started to take a super what is skyrocketing thing on this thing like we have a lot of contributors into github repositories right now we are more than 5000 stars right now i remember correctly the last metrics which i have from github so which means that like it's it's getting traction i want the contribution from you people to start using their report errors report issues it's not just you need to contribute say that something is not working for you in your scenario then that helps us to build the product much better okay as part of the community right so uh, so what we'll do is like probably we'll take a quick five minute break and then when you come back like what we'll do is like we'll check about database and then spring boot uh, and then also show you a reactive example and if possibly we'll also try to see build and deploy the application into my kubernetes cluster from the command line right just like that okay so we can take a five minute break and then maybe we can come back at 12 5.
All right? Okay. Um, let's let's start doing few things. I think I had a lot of um, good discussions. People are asking me about Springboard stuff and other stuff. So two things we'll do right now. The first one I'm going to say you the the natural way how we do with database applications with Quarkus. Okay. So we call something called Spanish. I'll explain all this thing. So one of the critical things here is that the guys who are behind writing Quarkus right now are the guys who are the uh, actually the founders of hibernate okay so those are the guys who are behind this so they know this natural optimizations that needs to be done at hibernate level still they are improving so we bought in a few more things from that into uh, this kind of framework that is supported here and then we call them as panache right i just it's just a name right i just tell you what things it does and then the second example what you'll see is like i'm going to take a typical spring boot application the rest controller and everything and then move that into Quarkus and then show you like the performance differences that we have with the natural uh, application which run is spring boot and then spring boot with Quarkus then what's the difference we have with both of them all right so uh, it's all going to be code there's no to be any slides so uh, let's start to do with this so as, as we did earlier so I'm just going to say create a Quarkus project maven I'm just still going to call a fruit app so because uh, some of the code of the thing which I wrote here, like it actually ties with this. The first thing which I need going to do here is like the extensions that we get, right? So what I'm whatever I'm going to do right now is part of is part of our tutorial, as I said earlier. So if you go here on the tutorial, so I have the link so of this tutorial here. So this is called as uh, bitly.quarkus tutorial. If you see the first slide of my thing, I have the link for this tutorial here, the bitly link. This takes you to this tutorial. So we have all the stuff which you just covered, Quarkus application and then database integration and other stuff. In case if you miss my commands, don't worry, everything is there, all right? And then we also have talking about instruction and then we have talk about reactive. I'll show you about reactive application also the last, if you have a time, I think, I think you should have time. The first thing I'm going to say here is that on this, uh, I need one thing. So since I'm going to process JSON data, which is going to, I need to have JSON to Java, Java to JSON serialization. I'm going to use JSON B. Um, I think there should be one rest EC JSON B serialization. Uh, rest EC JSON B. Okay, I just picked this, these two things for now. I'll just add a few things later. So I'm just going to go here, go to my demos, uh, call this as Panache. Panache is little English name, so of here. So let's go there. Okay, it's created there. Open a new window. So, is this the one which I had already? Okay. We'll close. I'm not sure this is the one which I had earlier. So let me do one thing. Let me do it again. Close folder. So, let's flash. Uh, Marcus demos. Let me delete this jar. And I think I was trying my demos yesterday. I have some residue left over there. So let me create this again. Close the repo. Right. Let me open here. Generate Marcus project. I'll, I think probably I'll add the JSON B later. <laughs> Maven, Acme, Fruit App, everything is same. Fruit resource. Just last use. In case me that I do this, generate it here. Right. So I don't I don't have anything related to database right now. On this one, this is pretty much same thing which we opened there earlier. So what we do right now is that let me put this this way and then I'm going to call this as API. Okay. So the first one I just call uh, path. Exact R is path. And I say slash root, right? So this is a simple API. I'm just going to say Apple, right? So the first things which we need to have, let me start with the, the development mode right now so that we can do active development as well as discussion here. So let me start this saying that MVN compiled. That's good I did last time. I don't want the test 
to interrupt or thing. I don't, I'm not going to show you any test, so I'll just disable this. This test is equal to true. And I'll keep the palm open so that you'll see what extension is actually doing, all right? So uh, I'm going to write this, and then I'm going to have the resource application properties also open in parallel, because these are the two things which you'll be using heavily. As good as that, I'll just do compile and then say Quarkus dev. Okay, the dev mode gets started. Wait. So uh, as good as the first thing, right? So any with any database development, the first thing is that I will add as a Java developer, I'm used to adding Hibernate and then the JDBC dependency. All right. So I'm just going to use MariaDB here. So which is running within my Cube cluster. I'll just connect to the MariaDB stuff there. I'm just going to use MariaDB for my sake. So what I first thing I do is like I just need to go add extensions. Okay. As I said earlier, with the live reload features which you have, it's not only for a class path right now, it also does your dependencies also, right? So the first thing I'm just as good as I did last time, that's I'm just going to uh, disable the color because uh what is Just say false so that like I don't have colors here. So now what happens? I just say add extensions to current project. The first extension I'm going to have add is like taking time. Let's go and come back. Okay. Hibernate ORM data is the first one I need to add. Hibernate Panash. I'll come back to Panash in a second. Don't worry about what is that. And then I need to have MariaDB or JDBC driver. Okay. And also I'm going to have open API. I'll come back to open API again, right? So or else I'll add it later, right? So these are the very basic things which I need to add for any CRUD based application, right? I need to have Hibernate data for persistence and other stuff. And then I'm going to use Panache. I'll tell you what Panache is and the JDBC driver. So these are three things which I'm going to use. I'm just going to say these ones and then the moment I do this, it's just going to pull out those jars and then add it to your form.xml. That's all you're going to do. Like if you see that once this is added, you'll see those jars getting added to your form XML, right? So you have the JSON B, we have ORM, we have MariaDB, and all these stuff. And be sure that you have to use something which is already quarkized, right? Which means that this has to be rebuild those jars and make it available in the Maven repository. Maybe say like it's it's quarkus enabled, which is called call as extensions. That way, like you get all the benefits that Quarkus gives you on these jars as well. And one strong recommendation is that don't mix jars. Don't use a Quarkus Hibernate jar and non Quarkus Hibernate jar together. Right? That will cause some weird issues. So don't do this. Either you stay only with Quarkus or only with Hibernate. Okay? Don't mix much at both these things. Okay. Yes. Right. So if you if you see this uh, the Quarkus bomb here. The bomb gives you all the versions. Okay, I think it's its latest uh, Hibernate with five, and we are making sure that we are not updating it to the latest release as well, right? Each Quarkus version will be tying up to one Hibernate version. Right? I think if you see the bomb, the bomb will list you the exact version. I don't have that right handy, but bomb should have the version of it. Okay? I think even if you can see the, uh, the Java dependencies, I'm not sure this is going to list you. Uh, it has a Maven dependency here. So let's see what Hibernate version it has. Uh, it little bit uses a different. It doesn't use the exact Hibernate stuff. I think it's 5.4. Okay. So <clears throat> once you have this, so what I have to do is like at the first job I need to do is write an entity, right? That's the first thing which I do everywhere. So let me write a new file. The good thing about I want to show you here is that if you go here, the Java is already loaded. And then from the previous one, which has CDI and REST JSON B, you see that matting the dependencies, it automatically reloads your thing, right? Since Quarkus is so fast, you the reload is negligible, right? And then you see this all the other things like your Hibernate and other stuff also loaded for you, all right? So once I have this, so the first one I do is like go and create an entity, okay? Root dot, I call this as root dot Java, and then say class, and then I have my entity uh, with with Quarkus, what you can also do is like I don't need to write all the getters and setters. I can just do say like public string. I just have name and season for this name public string 
these are okay these are two things i'm going to have obviously i'm going to induce an error in a second so but this is what your basic entity now what happens here is that i don't need to write those getters and setters for me anymore just make them public methods or the public class i mean variables inside your thing and it's going to be available for every other stuff all right so let me put this here uh, and i'll come back to this in a second and now i'm all good right now to get started the only other thing i need to say here is the the database connectivity right what should be my database connectivity i need to have i'm just going to copy paste the the thing i'll come back to that what it has means right so the data source url etc etc uh, i don't i don't remember them top of my head so i have to copy paste them right so i'm just going to use a, a database here so i have a, a this thing let me put this as prod okay and then i'm also going to use uh, i think i have a docker compose here as well if i'm not wrong okay so and then i'm going to put dev uh, just going to say okay let's not do this so I'll, let me connect to the database which i already have so quarkus let me go find which database i have right now so uh, So I have a MariaDB here. So I need to know the IP address, 112, and the port here is that I'm just going to expose this another port. So it's going to be uh, 12, and then it's going to be 33313. Okay. I'm already having it running, so I don't not going to start one more here. So I'm just going to use the same one here. So if you see this. Uh, this particular stuff i am going to use this is a standard ones if you see this uh here let me put the bracket here right i'm having a data source url i'm having a driver name these are a pretty much standard hibernate stuff and then i'm going to use dialect maria db dialect here and then i'm going to use a username and password i'm just drop and create each time so that i can see the thing and then i'm going to show you the logs because in that way i can show you that the reload even happens even at the database side which means that the moment i change something on my entity class and the reload happens the database gets dropped and recreated all right so let me open this uh, tiny utility i have uh, mini cube uh, service okay, this is just a web ui for your uh, database thing um, so the database is going to be called as mariadb uh, demo password demo db okay so i have this fruit table already there I just did the test yesterday so i'm just going to use this fruit test i think it's going to be dropped and recreated anyway so let's go and delete this the two things which we have right now uh where is this drop go and just drop the table right now and I'll just also delete. It's not going to be a table. It's going to be a schema, but don't worry. The schema will be there. So, all right. So I have a table, I have a database, and I have everything ready. So let's go start this one right now. So, uh, and a moment I'm going to say, let me have one more window open here. Moment I'm going to say localhost 8080. Uh, what is that? What did you have? P colon eighty-eight slash API slash root. Right now the problem it starts right here, right? I want to induce this error. I'll tell you what this error is. Right, let me let's access this on a browser so that the error is clean. So if you see this error, it says that no identifier expected for an entity. Okay, this is where I'm going to tell you what panache is. So any CRUD based applications you do with Hibernate, right? The basic things we do with Light, we'll have CRUD operations, and then we'll have identity operations, and we'll have those entity classes created. And beyond that, we also do something called as a service class, the DAO plus service, right? So now if you see this, the amount of boilerplate code that we write in them is huge. That if it's, let's say, for example, I develop application one, and then I write, and let's say, a fruit class, and develop an application two, I write a user class, and if you see all these things, if the, the the amount of code that I repeat, right, the finder methods, finder by ID, find by something else, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, 
and then your id things which is which is going to be auto generated ids for example and all these things that right? you're going to keep repeating them and for each of those entity classes i should have a dao class and a service class which means that the amount of boilerplate code and amount of number of classes i'm going to write is keeps on increasing so what we did with panash right the panash is just a name which we gave it as panash nothing to do with this more making it more easy to for you to write what we did with that we just combined the dao and service together the moment i extend my pana i mean the entity class with panash i'm going to get all the dao methods all the service methods the boilerplate code of the box still you can also write your own also you'll see an example about that as well right it's not that it will stop you from writing your own but i can also write one thing one of the examples here is that no identifier for my entity which means that i have not defined an at the rate id in my particular fruit entity class that's the example there right if you imagine this again i don't need to do this right and in the case i assume that my entity is going to have auto generated ids right using sequences then i don't need to write this so in those case again this is again a set of boilerplate code that you put so what the first thing you have to do is like first thing i have to do here is go to my entity class let me put the other way also so i'm just going to change this method to get all fruits okay and this i'm going to say fruit you'll be wondering what this is i'll come back to this so now what happens this is a very basic select star from fruits kind of thing right which is always going to write so which is your first method you always write so what right now i need to do first is i'm just going to say extends okay the moment i say panash entity this comes from quarkus hibernate orm so we just added this now what happens this things will all automatically go off for you now i get a list all plus list plus sort method okay and i'll have lots of other methods inside this class if you put this thing here let me move it a little bit yeah okay and then when i say remove fruit out and then see what all methods i have i have a lot of these methods right these count count star delete find etc etc a lot of these methods which you keep writing again and again and again and again right maybe in some cases you will be abstracting to a utility class and doing all this stuff which i exactly don't need to write here the moment i say extend panash entity it's already there right including your by defaults of finder methods are also there find by thing we'll also be writing on find methods i have find by id find my id optional blah 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 find all etc etc okay the moment i say list so now we are going to say list all i'll get the, all the list and then now what i'm going to do here is that i'm going to do list fruit okay this is what i need to do all right so now i'm going to send a list of fruits which is basically effectively sorry basically going to take all the fruits from my database and give it to you all right so now we are good with this so let's do this all right so let's go and refresh my browser to see if the error goes off okay so there is no api fruits here so i just need to save this class okay and then now i just see what replace sometimes it gets struck let me go back here and start this again i just say api fruits okay now we get an empty list all right so now becomes another crucial thing so how many of you i think most of you are developing rest api application which is backed by database right So one of the crucial things what we have problems when not a problem probably a difficulty is right we have to use multiple tools for example I have sent JSON data and get a JSON data that's a very common scenario right when I'm doing this what happens I have to use tools like Postman or something else like some other REST API tools so that I know what exactly the schema I need to send what exactly the schema I need to have right so that I can send a proper data during my test and then even if I set a validation to be done I can send improper data to do validation. now right now as of now what i'm doing is that i'm just using the browser to do this work i want to have much more easier way right how i can do this so one of the ways how many of you heard about swagger okay everybody know about swagger right what we have done with parkus again is that we have also added swagger out of the box which means that i just need to add open api dependency since rest ec is based on open api standards the moment i enable open api it's going the swagger ui is going to read your rest api and show you all the methods that is available there which means that my development process is super super easy if that's not enabled for production mode a production mode swagger ui is disabled i can still enable it but by default it's disabled 
okay so let's do this so for example i need to go so how do we add um, dependencies okay add extensions right and these are the, everything that is always there a corresponding maven command line thing also right if you use quarkus plugins then maven command if you're a command line guy they can also use command line but most of the people are U, ui guys so i just using gui for this case but i'm i mostly use it from command line i said i need to use open api that's a small dry implementation which is nothing but the micro profile implementation of open api so i'm just going to use open api here and then that's the only extension i'm going to have because i'll also be getting one more error soon okay and then i'm going to say one extension selected and you obviously see the same command running there and then you'll have a bunch of other reloading of classes happens your form gets dependency and i'll also see that there is a rest ACI j and b or blah 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 another things loaded here so let's see if i have my open a swagger api coming up here right so local force swagger ui is that added to my thing open api no it's not added sorry <clears throat> let's add it again open api small dry open api web which means that it includes the swagger dependency right and then i just add one thing here and then i added the extension let's see if it gets added it is added now if you go back to my thing so dev mode right so let me close it and start it again All right, I have the Swagger UI and small dry open API thing also added for you. Okay, I can make this short because I don't have big logic to write. You see this here? This extension is getting added. Now, when I go and refresh this, what happened? I'm going to get the fruits API right now here, which means that I can start trying these out, all the things everywhere from here, so that during my development cycle, my, my thing is going to be much faster. Okay, let's add one method right now. The first method I'm going to add is like even before I'm going to list. The other one about the good thing about this thing is that so right now we don't have any data inside my thing right so what i can also do is like if i put an import.sql right which is a standard way we put we put preload data right i'm just going to do a preload of data so i'm just going to use import.sql here and then say insert into root id name season values you know that it's called as next underscore val or next val hibernate sequence i think it should be next val together okay let's say i put uh, mango comma so don't i'm just going to use some random fruits don't worry that if i put a season wrong so orange winter uh what else we have apple I'm just going to still going to call as winter okay just for a query sake right so uh, we have all these things here so right now what happens is that the moment i say reload again and go to refresh my ui it's going to watch for this import.sql files or you can still override this file name where it's going to preload some data, right? This is typically used in your development time, right? This, I'm going to go back here and then say refresh. Now, if all goes well, you should see some inserts happening here, and hibernate inserts. And when I do go and query the data, just say try it out, execute. There's no example available, right? So, uh, where is that? Okay, so what's happening here is that let I have the JSON be put down here. So let me see public list fruit. Um, okay, that's a media type, right? So uh, let me make the media type common across, right? And because all the data is going to be JSON, right? So this is something I usually miss. Uh, that consumes JSON, okay? I'm going to say produce and consume JSON. Uh, this is what I'm going to do. There's no big thing in this. So you know that it's, it's going to be reloaded. So let's go and refresh again. Obviously, you'll have the classes reloaded. And then let's go try out again. 
execute we got the json data coming back to you right so i did not write any code to do json conversion because i use json b which gets naturally when my object is returned via the thing it's naturally it serializes and deserializes my data and give it to you as well right the first thing the next thing which you obviously write as a developer i return my uh, get all method right uh, crud the retrieve right and then i'm going to do a create now right the first next thing so what i want to do is like i'm just going to do a post to fruits i'm just going to copy paste the same method instead of get i'm going to say post right and then add obviously i need fruit to be added and now if you see this in order for me to say the first thing we will usually do is that i go and first write a persist method inside my entity class right i don't need to do that now so i just say fruit dot persist that's it job done all right and then usually what happens is that in the rest convention usually the add methods and sometimes what something expect that we just say accepted right http202 we don't return the entity or anything right in that case what i can do is like i can just make this thing res return me response rather than a entity and then what i can do is like i just say response uh, dot build uh, status is status uh, accepted and then build okay i'm just going to send this response back which means that it's going to send me 202 in this case what i'm trying to do is like i'm just trying to say that return me save it and just return me the response back okay so to do this and then when i go back again refresh the swagger ui you'll see the new method coming in picture for you the post one and now since it's an open api based implementation so when i go and say execute it gives you the schema the empty schema here right which is exactly is going to repeat your json class the fruit or whatever it is right this in this way i know how exactly i need to send the data so testing is different the destructive testings are all different like which you can do later but the moment you can do is like i just going to say like okay send this data this is the advantage when i'm using open api because and then jacks rs less easy kind of stuff which is standard based ones because open api is also standard jacks rs is also standard everything is standard based so it knows how to read the standard apis and then put it here okay in cases of some cases with spring boot this is not possible because spring boot out of the box i cannot convert my spring boot rest api into swagger ui i need to have the swagger integration happening and dependencies added etc we don't need to do all those things here okay so now when i go here and then say okay i'll just say uh, another nice fruit i'm just not going to add anything because it's auto generated uh, banana I just say fall just giving a random thing is not exactly fall so when i say execute right now now you will see that the code is getting internal server error this is another error which you need to know anybody guess what's wrong that's a super guess come on sorry no id is auto generated there's one more super critical thing with database no no you're close transactions okay so so when i say like i've not made this method transactional because anything within hibernate is to be transaction which means that completely commit or completely roll back right but i have not enabled any transaction because when you start to run your application it does not have any transactions for example if you see the error also here it says you are close but you did not say the exact word right so the transaction is required exception right because it does not have the transaction right so how to do that pretty easy go here add extension and that should be jta if i'm not wrong take some time because you have to do a rest api call and come back there's a transaction manager here like this i just need to add this okay and then say here most it should come back but only thing is that it's already added and then i say go here and say this method as like this uh, 
transactional. That's it, the job done, right? I don't need to do anything else right now. And then I go back here and then do, do a reload. Swagger UI. I should get the API fruits method here. And then let's go and try out again. So let's take this out because ID is auto generated. And then I say fall. Okay. You don't have fall in India, but I'm just saying that. Now when you go back here, it's done. And then I have 202 because that's what the response code I'm returning. There is no entity return. Let's go back and query the fruits to see if we got this. Let's go and try it out again. There you go. So we have the banana added here. Right? So now the other one which you want to do right now with database is that I want to have a finder method. Right? Let's say I want to query all the uh, I mean fruits based on a season. Just say an example, right? It's so easy to write that thing right now. Okay. And then uh, let's say a public, I, I'll copy the same methods, right? Because it's going to be pretty much same. So, and then it's going to be a post. And uh, I could even still have it as get, should not be a problem. Find by season. And then I use, so how many of you know about path param? Okay, great. So I'm just going to call this a season as a path param. So string season. And then I'm going to say get all fruits by season. So this is the syntax which you use for path params. And then I'm going to say fruit dot. I'm just going to have the same method, right? Find by season. And now you'll be wondering, so this is this is an example to demonstrate that since it is panache entity, I'm not restricted by what the method is given by. I can also have my own methods written, right? But still I use the underlying methods, right? For example, I'll go here and write the same method here. I'm going to copy paste this and go here. What I'm going to say here is like there is no path that I'm here. It's just going to take a string season. And then I'm going to make this static so that I can call it directly. Okay. And then I'm going to say list, this util list. And now what I say is that since I told you there is a lot of built in methods, I just say find by season, which is already a member of this class, entity class, which means understands that. And find what value the season should have. It's also I'm passing here. And then I'm saying that find all, right? List all or find all list, right? Okay. In this way, what happens, I'm writing this much little code because boilerplate is abstracted. I'm just saying going and find out the same method from the season variable, it's already there, which gets translated into HQL, hibernate query language, naturally for you under the underlying intent, and then it's going to list you back those things for you, right? So let's try this out again. So uh, I'm gonna go and then refresh my browser again. Uh, Swagger UI should now give me Three methods. The season also comes here. It asks you what season you want. So I think what we had, I think we gave winter, right? Uh, summer. Summer had two fruits, right? So or winter. Okay. We can do any one you want. Right? So let's go and try it out. And then I'm going to say winter, and then say execute. There you go. It's so easy for you now. So tell me, like, how many days you would have spent to write this little code? Obviously, like if it's a young programmer, maybe four or five days, a little bit seasoned programmer, maybe two days, or even the, even the normal guy, it at least take a day, right? It was even, as, even if it's a kind of knows all those stuff, right? But that's the kind of uh, the developer experience that we are giving to you, even writing your database applications. It's not hard anymore, right? It's going to be super easy. Plus we give you all the other things, right? Like what we saw earlier, like faster boot at time, faster startup time, optimizations and everything on top of what you have right now. Any questions here? Uh, yes, the exception can be handled in your uh, entity class, right? The exception will be thrown to your API class. The API is going to handle exceptions. So even the transaction name wrong, it's an exception, right? But my application was able to report the exception. You just need to catch all of the exception. And do. So one of the good things about microservices is that usually what we do, we don't handle the exceptions inside your microservice class. You'll give it back to your client. But this is going to be a REST API. 
So usually in microservices world, what we do is like just give the exception, throw the exception back to a client, which we call as fail fast. My client, let the client handle however he wants to handle it, right? So maybe like you can just, you don't need to send the exact trace. Maybe you can send, send a wrapper trace, right? Send 404 or 503 or something else, right? Non-200 uh, code. Yeah. Yes. Reload. Uh, that's a, that's a very good thing. I don't think so. We have it right now because it just monitors your complete uh, source code folder. So which means that anything changed there. Uh, but that's a good one. Probably like I'll make a note of it and then see if we can do that. Just like your docs. What do you think you're talking about, right? But that will be a nice one. Probably we can do this not to ignore this. Maybe we can just I just let them know. But the only problem right now, right? It works in the fail like. It, behind the scenes the maven compiler runs to actually do this stuff right so even though if i mention this not to load this right because it's still in the class path the maven compiler cannot be able to decode that but that's a very nice feedback i'll take it back thank you so much for that okay. any other questions okay so I'll, I'll move to spring boot which is everybody was asking in second okay but did you understand this so what why i showed this before is because the moment i show you spring boot like we'll do again a lot of boilerplate things a lot of hidden things right so from your from a, from your perspective, tell me, is there anything hidden or anything magic happening here? There is no big magic here. So everything is crystal clear for you to say this, right? One of the as a developer, one of the things I hate is that a lot of magic. I don't like magics to happen when I write my code. I want to exactly understand what my code is doing so that it'll be able for me to debug into this, right? Obviously, Spring Boot is known for those magics. I'm not ridiculing any framework, okay? But I'm just saying this. So we are not trying to make any magics here. So we're just taking away the boilerplate code and giving you an extra handle, right? Don't write all these things. And still, you can write override ID. I can write my ID class. I can still override it and use it. In case if I don't know string, if I want to use something like some other mechanism, I can still use it. But I'm just giving you a straightforward example here, right? So uh, let's do one more thing here. So uh, maybe we'll add the cloud later, okay? Because I want to show you Spring Boot. Uh, because it's it's no big deal to convert this into deploying it in Kubernetes because I just need to containerize and deploy it. Okay. So maybe if we have time, I can show you containerization at the last. So let me close this one. Uh, close folder. Okay. So I need to open another Spring Boot stuff. Uh, let me open. <clears throat> All right, so here comes your very famous Spring Boot stuff. So I have multiple things. This is the, the first example. I want you to watch these form XMLs. This is this is your typical Spring Boot application, database application. Okay, I'm not I'm not changing. I think I'm just using the repository here. If you see in my application here, I have a controller which controls my fruits. Uh, the stuff exactly same thing what you saw earlier, and then I also have a data. It's a fruit entity, which is a typical entity. This is the boilerplate thing which I was talking about, which we did not write with Panache entity, right? And then this is again the same old boilerplate stuff which we did not write, right? No big logic here, right? So though though we have generators which gives you the, all these stuff, but still your cloud looks big. If you have let's say 20 columns in a table, then this is going to look really huge, all right? And then what also I'm going to do right now is show you the fruit repository. Which is right here. The first time when I I'm also like Spring Boot a lot, but the first time when I write those crude repository, I was totally clueless like what I'm doing. What does it do? What does a repository do? What are the other stuff do? Where does these methods comes from? So why I need still if you see this the old examples right? Though I'm extending this and giving you abstracting you a few things in a generic way, but still I'm writing this fine by ID. Why should I write it? Again, I'm just saying few differentiations that we had, right? I was totally confused with this, but just to say, coming back to the context, I have a fruit entity, I have a fruit repository, all right? The only thing probably I need to go change the database. So don't worry about this greater controllers for just to say, hello world, right? I can still go and say hello from my Spring Boot application, right? 
And if you see this controller, typical rest controller, it's nothing changed here. It's your own rest controller I've done. I have not written, if you see anywhere, I have not even written one single line of Quarkus code here. All right? That's where I tell you where the power of Quarkus comes. So this is this line of code. If you go here, this is standard one. Let's go here and then uh, change the database. I think if I'm not wrong, let me go and grab the the other guy's database thing. SRC main space space. Let's open this in this so that I can copy paste this quickly. Right. So this is the uh, let me call the fruit DB itself so that like or demo DB whatever you want. So this is your standard. Spring Boot application where I'm going to start. So how do you start your Spring Boot? I'm just going to a little bit go to the CLI because I get more space to show you something here. Uh, okay. So now uh, I need to set some variable uh, so that I go to the right place. All right. So. <clears throat> MVN clean package. All right, this, I'm just doing a typical Spring Boot application package right now, right? So we start to run the Spring Boot application Java dash jar um, target. Where is that jar? Right. Hopefully, it connects to my database. All good. Cool. I'm connected to the database. You see the time? Five point. Okay, let me write somewhere, right? This is 5.5055 seconds, right? I want to measure these things, 5.5055, all right? There is no change to my thing. One thing I want to observe right now, I was, we are talking about RSS, residence set size, right? Okay, so what is that? So let me go here and pull out my alias. So I'll just copy this alias here for you. So the resident, resident set size is what is mean is that, so this amount of memory that is taken inside my random access memory, right? The amount of space. In Java world, it means that it could be a meta space, it could be a heap, it could be your hotspot, it could be other classes that gets loaded, right? All these things gets loaded. That's where RSS stands for, right? Resident set size. So this is a small alias. You can you can use the same alias in any command. Unless I also have this on my slide. So if you see this 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 little one like what in Unix processing, you can go and see this. What should be my RSS size? I'm trying to go and do this RSS here. So just go go here and then run this RSS uh, ps RSS and let's find out our Java application here, right? Let's go Java dash jar. You see here? I'm just going to uh, Scan this and see if I can zoom here. 603 M, right? This is going to be my uh, our residence set size, which is going to be a fixed heap size or fixed memory that's going to be used as always, right? Irrespective of I'm going to use, I'm not going to use all the 603 M, which is not actually required. That's optimization which you have done with the Quarkus right now. So when I go to Quarkus, I'm going to stop this one, okay? I will run it in two modes. Just control C. Okay, you measured that this is going to be 603, right? Let me put that also there. So RSS is 603 M. So this is JVM mode. Let's do an apple to apple comparison, right? I'll just do a JVM mode for Quarkus also. So what is required from my side when I'm going to change this to Quarkus, right? So I have a Quarkus DB a branch, which is just exactly the same. Okay. Uh, please clean your repository. Okay. <clears throat> Let me copy this, uh, this thing because I changed the database here. Okay. So let me go here. Okay, I already have it. So git reset. Okay, git checkout. Move it from here. So DB Quarkus. Okay. It's exactly the same, except that I made a little tiny changes, right? Your fruit controller remains same. Do you see any changes in fruit controller? 
No. The fruit entity? No. The fruit repository? No. This leave of grid control, data controller. I'm not changing that also. Okay, this is not under consideration. The first change which I did was in my property files. What I have to do is like I have to start using our Quarkus dot extensions, right? Because I'm going to make Spring Boot run in a Quarkus way. Okay, exactly. So from an application code, no change. You all agree with that? There's no change to your application code. Now the first change you see is in your property file where I'm just replacing. I'm not even doing this. Most of the properties are also valid. But what I'm trying to do is a spring dot data source instead of that I'm using Quarkus dot data source. That's the only difference. Just the name of the property is going to change. I just put these things example in this case so that you know like what's the differences we have using here, right? So and then also like the other ones, I'm just going to use SQL log and just going to use Quarkus Hibernate dialect, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, all right. This is good. So what we'll do right now here is that I'm just going to change this one to say this one, right? I need to change my database so that it finds my demo DB. Just doing that here. All right. I'm not using fruit DB or something. Uh, I'm sorry about this. There is a very crazy issue which kinds of copy copy paste everything back. Okay, so let me take this all out. Crazy, crazy little bug. If I take all comments out, then it will work out. Okay. Ah, come on. Don't get started. Okay. Let me do one thing. Okay. So let me open this in a PDSRC main resources. Let's not worry about this. Okay. Let's open back again. So there is there is only change I did. Quarkus property, you understood this, right? From code level, there is no change. The next change probably we had the first step is to remove my Spring Boot dependency, right? I don't need Spring Boot POM. As I told you earlier, I need to have to do this thing. This is more from a build side. I'm just removing the Spring POM uh, dependencies from here. That's the first step. All right. That's what I marked as first step here. I can share this repository is also part of the sources if you want to go refer back. Step two, obviously the dependency management which I need to use. Again, dependency from safe. And then if you see this, the only change from the step two is right. I'm not using Spring Web. Instead of that, what we did is like we re rebuild the Spring Web via Quarkus extensions. We be as Quarkus Spring Web. Exactly same, except that we use adapted to the Quarkus way of doing things, right? That is the first one we did here. Second one we did here was around the Quarkus Spring Data JPA. So where instead of using Hibernate dependencies, I'm still using JPA dependencies, Spring JPA dependencies, which are adapted to Excel, which means there is no code change again from your side. Okay. So just doing Quarkus prefix is not going to change any of your classes. It's just going to make it Quarkus enabled, right? Because Quarkus needs few things from the underlying core classes from kind of thing, right? That's what you metadata kind of stuff, right? That's what we change here, right? JDBC, Quarka, same thing what we used in Panache and other stuff, and then Ibernate ORM. Okay, because JPM using, I'm just using Ibernate ORM here. That's the only change I do. Okay, other than that, your Spring Boot project is exactly same as your Quarkus project. No difference. You see this? You appreciate this? Right, so I'm not doing any change to my code. I'm not doing anything, which means you're you're moving from Quarkus to, I mean, Spring Boot to Quarkus is so smooth. Except that I have to change few things at the build time, which is always developers find it easy because I'm going to change the dependencies. I'm not going to touch my code or anything. The only change which I did is I knocked off the, the application code, which is not is no longer needed, just for clarity's sake. Okay, otherwise, even you can have the application code also and keep it running. Because now what happens your application code will not come into picture because the way Quarkus runs your jar is different from how your Spring Boot runs the jar. There is no Uber jar concept here. It's all thin jar. Okay. Any question? Yes, please. Right. So this this when you put this, this makes sure that only Quarkus 
related hypernate jars are picked up as i told you earlier the guys who develop these frameworks are core engineers of hypernate so they know the exact dependency tree right so you don't need to worry about that right the moment like if you have hypernate jars if you have hypernate jars put down with spring specific stuff just remove them that's all so which means that my dependency is shrinking right now i'm not increasing my dependency okay any questions until now it's clear like what's the step i follow like no code change that's the first step the change step i just change the properties just to have the quarkus prefix so that like it understands the quarkus stuff understands this the th third step is just just trimming my uh, uh, dependencies to just to match the quarkus dependencies right so that i can get the benefits of what quarkus is giving me all right yes yes as you can use third party libraries as long as it does not cause a reflection that's the reflection is a pain only for a native compilation but it's a jvm mode no issues i can use i'll show you an example the next reactive example which i'm going to show you i'm going to use a third party library a google library there but still it works right but when i try to compile it native it gave an error yesterday saying that few things in that that it's not compatible for native compilation so i need to fix it either i need to go for add an extension or find another library which actually compatible with that right so and then the step 3 is that if you go to your spring boot jar i mean spring boot application this is what i'm going to do i'm just going to replace my plugins i'm not going to use spring boot run i'm going to use quarkus run so i don't use those dependencies as well here and that's it your native blah 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 another stuff which comes into picture so do you see it the hard way i want i want seriously honest us because we had a super heated argument if you know i think most of you know about josh lang that we had we had this presented at devox belgium and then we had a super heated back end conversation from josh lang saying that this is not fair okay because he knows he knows that this is kind of going to eat up people right because this is mind blowing because i'm not doing any change i'm not doing any code change but i'm getting the super performance and super fast application in fact of second still using my own lovable spring boot programming model right but again i tell you if you see panash i want you to compare this and with panash and see what's the simplicity we are bringing in right that should also be there like in case of like wherever i can make my application as greenfield start doing with panash right away don't don't do migration right but still if you are comfortable with spring boot and then you want to do this you can do this but we are adding right now as i said earlier just web and data is the two things which we have migrated as extensions and we are adding other extensions in coming releases so which will be there right now we are because these are the very commonly used two things which you wanted to port first and then start working on other stuff all right so let's start this and then application and see what happens let me go and let me see if i have any changes to the this thing i don't have anything here i say mvn clean package same commands no change to commands also package this switch of the color no i did not okay so the color gives me super odd so java dash jar same command no change just change to runner jar instead of a snap dot jar One point seven zero seven seconds. Spray, same Spring Boot application with CRUD loaded with Quarkus is giving you a performance startup time as where is that? Come on, friend has to come up right now because it's been where is that? Come on, here. So the color is probably showing you something nonsense here. One point seven zero seven seconds. Exactly same application. No change, right? The next one which you want to show is like. i need to write it there right i forgot that okay so i think i ask epam like kind of put this out right somewhere saying that i showed you real time i'm not showing you anything which is which is not real right 1.707 seconds for a crud right so let's see what rss is taken right did then the same command again uh, cls that's my rss Where's my guy? There you go. Three forty-four MB. Because the one of the things why it is little bit higher, and probably we missed to check out Panash. 
But one of the things why it is a little bit tired because I'm still using a lot of spring dependencies inside, right? Which which needs to be carried forward. So that's the reason why we technically like, but almost if you see, it's almost half, right, of what your Spring Boot gave and what this gave, right? And then now let's do one more thing, last little thing here. So let's let's see what happens if I do a native compilation of this, right? So MVN clean, MVN IPNP native. package okay. it'll take some time uh, while it takes maybe i can answer a few more questions maybe it will take maybe three minutes close to three minutes because i have a hibernate and other dependencies to be added any questions micronaut okay micronaut again micronaut has issues it doesn't co even compare with the same thing right Few things. See what we done with Graal. We had not used the entire Graal stuff. We just used only the substrate VM of Graal. So if you use Micronaut, Micronaut uses complete Graal. It has a strong dependency is Graal for us in Quarkus. We just say Graal is just an enabler, right? If you want to go this, you want to catch up this additional 30% of performance, then where you need to go Graal. Otherwise, if I'm happy with this, whatever JVM response time I'm getting with this, I don't need to go Graal. That's the only difference I know about thing because I never touched Micronaut. But again, that's a heavy competition around there saying like, what all things it do. I didn't even touch this framework. I think it doesn't, it also doesn't support Spring framework for your kind of information. You cannot do Spring with Micronaut. I cannot, I cannot take my Spring Boot application as it did like this into Micronaut. Not at all, right? So that is, see, that is one of the things which, so whatever we do at Red Hat, uh, generally from the upstream perspective and other stuff, these are all upstream, these are not downstream things. So what we make sure is that, so for an enterprise, right? We think from enterprise developers perspective saying like, when you move your application, so when you re-engineer or rework on your application, what should be your easiest path, right? Because for, for any engineering organization, right? It's not that something like, okay, I, I just, tomorrow I get a new release and then do this, right? That's exactly what we do with, you probably had two stickers, one is Kubernetes and OpenShift, right? So what we do with OpenShift is like Kubernetes is upstream. And if you see Kubernetes has a release every three weeks. If I'm going to take Kubernetes upstream and put it into production, then I'm going to have trouble because every three weeks, the thing is going to change. It's very unstable. So what we have done is like, but the platform is powerful, right? So what we did with OpenShift is that it's exactly the same Kubernetes. We take that, hardened it for enterprise ready and given for enterprise. So between a new Kubernetes release and OpenShift release, there's a three months time where we do regression, hardening, and everything else. And, but otherwise, it's exactly the same, and we upstream it again, which means we are again open source. So we're not closing any source, okay? So that's the difference between other people like who approach any frameworks and what we do. And this one is specifically, we make sure that this is going to be only at build time, not at runtime. So which means that people can easily port, they don't need to spend time on this. Okay, I think we got this running in uh, like 2.30, 2.30, that's what I said. So now when I say the target, now I'm running in native mode. Hello, you see this? This is going to be, again, super stuff, right? 0 0.034 seconds. That is for CRUD operation, exactly same database application. No, no big change, okay? Just I compile it natively, which is getting me extra 30%. Okay, uh, and then if you also see this, RSS, where is that? 21 MB, which means that as an organization, what also gives me is that it gives me those additional space that I have on my memory, which I can use for other applications. As I said earlier, in cloud, or even within your private data center, which is also another cloud, the only thing which is not shareable is your memory. The moment some of application attaches a memory, unless you get killed and then goes off, garbage collector, until then this memory is not usable by any application. Now, within this, for example, when I convert this into native mode and all these things, the place where I can run 10 services, I can run 150 services. That's the difference. I'm giving an approximate number, not exact number. That's a difference you need to say, like, which means that the moment I start adding more, I scaling my application, which means that I can run multiple scale of the thing, right? I have an example, I don't have it right now, but I have an example on Kubernetes where I was able to scale up to 250 pods with the same application. That's fraction of seconds. 
so which means that my scalability is so much and can handle spikes in request as exactly what serverless and microservices and cloud native application development demands from me okay any question on spring boot stuff i think hope it's it clarifies at least it gives you an idea but i don't think so it clarifies everything but obviously you can try this out any bug which you feel that just log us like we'll be able to help you get onto zulip chat tell this is an issue since the gentleman told me one of the finest issue like we ignore files i think i'll take back that okay and the last one before we wind up so i have to show you some reactive stuff so if you seriously if you like reactive stuff i can show you reactive stuff you want to see reactive stuff okay great let's go here so this is a uh, what i call uh, let me close this one so that i get some space close folder code i'll tell you what this application does is right so this application is going to get connected to kafka behind the scenes and then what it's going to do is like every 5 seconds so if you people have seen this uh, tickers at the station which keeps changing the language right this is exactly going to do the same thing uh, it's going to use google api behind the scene this gives you an example that i'm adding an external dependency but this external dependency is not quarkus dependency but this is not quarkus enable which means that i cannot do native compilation because of some class path issue which i identified yesterday probably reflection so what i need to do is this keeps sending you uh, every 5 seconds kind of going to send you this thing Out, what is outgoing means is that this is where we try to mix both imperative and reactive programming okay the first example so i have i have a greetings topic kafka topic is already there so i'm going to stream data into it right that is which means that my data message is flowing outgoing right that's what the outgoing means here right this is going to happen every 10 seconds just to simulate the demo but real time like we'll be having real data coming in all right and now what happened i need to have a service which needs to keep updating my ui right that's what something which you want that is what i use sse here and now what i use in sse is that i have something called as incoming from the greetings topic and then i keep outgoing here right which means that it's going to send you the translated greeting right onto my sse sockets this is little bit advanced and complex but i'm just trying to say you that there is no way like if you if you naturally see this this is the natural way of writing an imperative programming but behind the scenes we unified imperative and reactive and this gets translated into events okay for example we see here on this greeter service so i have see these don't worry about this these are bunch of things what is source and target language codes this is which is required by google translate and if we have there is one thing called as translated greetings so which keeps sending this uh, translations and then send the translations to this particular outgoing topic once it goes to this topic what also i have is that if you see the service <clears throat> where is that service what the hello service you see a service that i have something called as a source language where is that come on hello resource sorry so this is getting deprecated probably i need to change to channel so but don't worry about this for now so i'm injecting this particular translated greeting channel from where i get these messages inside right and then that's where i'm tying this particular one to this particular stream where i'm returning this channel which means that it keeps processing this data reactively send events back to my uh, service which is here so the moment the browser connects to this particular url it opens up a socket right this is a little bit different from ws thing with web sockets because web sockets has a limitation on amount of data that it can transport but with server sent events there is no limitation right the sockets get open and then it keeps listening for the events to happen all right so this is the this is the application overview right and then how do i configure so if you go back to my application properties i'm just configuring this to a kafka topic what is that it's listening on localhost 8080 or i can even have kafka topics listening i actually i'm going to connect to my kafka topic which is running inside my kubernetes server and then i have bunch of languages here and then this is going to use small right kafka this is the kafka implementation from microprofile kafka client right and small right a uh, reactive messaging is again an implementation of reactive messaging from microprofile it's all standard based nothing very specific to quarkus here okay and now <clears throat> let's start this one so let me go here and say let me say if i go to the kafka browser kafka bootstrap server okay so i have this uh, this export if you see this export uh, kafka browsers bootstrap servers i have two cuttle 
get to have a kafka server running inside my cluster so which means that with kubernetes even creating a kafka cluster is just a piece of cake okay for example let's say cake get let's think it could be just get kafka this gives you i just deployed a very small kafka cluster here which is single node one desired class i can just bump it up or down it uses a framework called a streamz.io how many of you heard about streamz okay streamz okay streamz kafka is the operator for kubernetes how to deploy kafka cluster on kubernetes it makes your life so so easier right if you're not on to this excel if you love kafka then i will ask you to go to this site streamz.io see this uh this particular side here this is the one where you want to go streamz.io this side takes you to the kafka cluster it helps you to, i think there are multiple quick starts and all these thing which gets you to get started with kafka instantly and you don't need to even to wait all right so that's that little bit different from, i'll put this links also in the uh, resources and then the moment we do this i have this kafka cluster running and then i have this uh, host up server also pointed to that because that's the i port ip address which you need to point to once i do this what i'm going to do is like i just say uh, mbn java dash jar target i'm not sure i have a not compile this right maybe in clean package it's packaged with that now i'm i'm having a running it in jvm mode and I, if you see my pom dependency i have one dependency that is going for your uh, google translate api okay so i'm just using google translate api behind the scenes it's going to use google translate api to translate your code so that's where it's going there but i'm using external dependency this is not native in uh, compatible so when i tried to compile it native yesterday i got some issues because there are some classes in this which is not compatible for native mode okay so once i have this done here so what i'm going to do is like i just say java dash jar target and then i start the runner okay it's connected to kafka here so you see this message so now it will start to send the messages here so when i go here uh, local host 8080 now my stream gets connected here so i hope i should get the uh, start to see this the translation happening on the fly which means that messages are flowing inside and my ui is getting changed right so i put on few indian languages also there right it keeps it uses the google api behind the scenes it gets translates the data and pushes the data back to kafka stream once it's there in the kafka stream the events get streamed back to your web ui using server sent events so this is a connection you make with streaming events how you build streaming applications with kafka right without quarkus this is a nightmare Okay, so that's what my point is because the programming model that Quarkus has brought in, it kind of unified these two reactive and imperative programming model, which making your life much easier. All right, so uh, so this is what this is how we kind of start to do much more reactive examples. I think you can wherever you want to have streaming data, you want to respond to events, you want to do all these things. It's pretty easy for you to do this. All right so i have this link also of this particular project it doesn't have a big read me if you are probably i'll just try to put a read me and update it back so this gives you again helps you to kind of do this this requires you to have a google account so that's the reason why i have not pushed it back because the apis are not free it is a paid api so i need to use the google credential so uh, all right so any questions on reactive you like this yeah <laughs> thank you Right, I think uh, that's pretty much I have. So for the day, um, I think uh, we are almost at the top of the hour, right? One thirty. I'll let's stop this. Okay. Uh, I, if, if there is questions, I can take. Otherwise, I leave it to you to close the. Yes, please. Residence set size is what. See, for example, like the moment I, what I mean by residence, is the random access memory thing, which means that usually when you measure the size, as a stack size, people also do. There's some application, right? They do offloading of cache, right, on the disk, right? 
So when talking about resident set size, it's nothing related to disk. So whatever is right there in my memory, random access memory, which application will access, need to access at any given point of time. That is called as RSS. I think that should be there in the Corcus site website, and uh, we are launching the, uh, the officially supported versions of Corcus also, apart from upstream and downstream thing, which is then that should be soon available. This I think probably next quarter, we should be having that also available there. So from the Red Hat officially supported versions. I, I, there were a lot of people. I think uh, I cannot quote their names, but uh, there are a couple of uh, big airlines, so that they wanted to use uh, Quarkus. They were waiting for the GA to happen and then GA was done and then they started using it. There are also a few other people like who have come back to us saying that they want a productized version because some company expects that it needs to be subscribed and all these stuff. They cannot use upstream ones. But from my perspective, this is doing everything at your runtime, except sorry, build time, which means that if, for example, if you use Maven, nobody supports Maven. If you use Gradle, nobody supports Gradle, except that there will be upstream releases happening. It's exactly like that. Except that if you are going to use some database stuff, native stuff, which might not have compatibility issues. But right now there are, I think I heard that there's also a couple of banks which I spoke last week in New Zealand. They are also having plans to use Quarkus. They are also preparing things up and then that's the reason why we are pushing to have a official release from Red Hat so that like within Red Hat so that we can go to the subscription system, right? So if you have OpenShift and other stuff, it comes literally for free for you. You don't need to pay extra. But the official, probably the, the upstream roadmap should be there on the site. Any other questions? If nothing more, thank you so much for listening to me for three hours patiently. I know this is an information over dump. Okay, you'll be cursing me like this guy, what this guy is showing, right? So, but I had thought like I could share this information. Anytime, you, any questions, you have my email ID, my Twitter handles, DM me, or you can send an email on questions. I will be happy to answer your questions. All right, and thank you so much for, for giving giving me an opportunity today, and thanks uh, Hyderabad Jack as well. Yeah, thanks so much. So, so guys, uh, just as a our regular ritual, right? Uh, before we wrap up this session, we are going to have a cup of quiz, and uh, so uh, we are going to have a cup of quiz right now. So the idea is. So guys, just go to kahoot.it and uh, on the home page of it, you will see, uh, you will see a request to enter an email. Anyone having any issues in connecting to this site?
even having any issues in connecting to the client so far? So remember the answers have to be correct and fast. Fastest. So I just start if, if everything is good to go. I just start in five, four, three, two, and one. Is is music interrupting anyone? I don't know how to turn this off at the moment. Uh -huh. No, it's not just any way. Okay, so we we'll move on to the next question. Okay. So Vishnu is at the top right now with 948 points. So we see that a lot of people have answered this question. This is awesome. Which means I told very well. Yeah, you told very well. You repeat it. Awesome. So again, it's Vishnu is on the top. We move on to the next question. Okay, so we still have 10 people, 10, 13 people who have given this answer incorrectly. That's fine. Yeah, the meter board is changed now. No, two more questions, final two questions. So this is the last question, guys. Uh, we have Shiva on the top. Okay. Shiva K. There is Ranga. This is a surprise. Two 
can we have Saurabh Ranga Eddy on the stage, please? <laughs> so just on a quick note, guys. Uh, Basically, what happens is the people who come here on the stage at the same time, we need people to help us with the access to the internet, the digital access to 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 the digital
Thank <laughs> you. 